Okay, the meeting will begin soon. Please take a seat. Okay, thank you for coming to today's uh, research workshop, the Pan-Asian Trauma Outcome Study, eighth research workshop. Uh, thank you for uh, coming to South Korea. Uh, thank you. I'm uh, Dr. Ju Jung, working in the uh, Patul CRN, and uh, it's really, uh, really an honor uh, for me to host you uh, for the Patul CRN. So uh, this meeting uh, will begin, and, and there will be some opening remark from uh, Dr. Sang Do Shin, the chair of Patos. And please uh, give your warm welcome to the Pat Dr. Shin. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is my great privilege to uh, give a uh, welcome remark here. Uh, we had a uh, two years uh, waiting for this kind of open meeting so, during the COVID-19 pandemic. So today we have uh, uh, many speakers, uh, outstanding lecture and uh, discussions are prepared. And uh, the first, uh, I would like to thank you for Tim Colt. He always traveled Korea without any dry or dry country in UK. So, so thank you very much. And uh, always uh, uh, the supporting uh, our meeting. Thank you very much. And also many uh, uh, Petos leaders, uh, Savaria, Dr. Markerson, and other country PIs. Thank you very much. And also 150, uh, 70 people are registered via online uh, for attending this meeting. So we should act again, uh, overcoming uh, two years and half, two years and half uh, years of the COVID-19 era. And then we have struggled for the COVID-19 infection and then spreading out of the infection and isolation, lockdown, and then EMS and hospital trauma care providers were very busy and overwhelmed. And then now we are starting to reassign, readjust, reoperate all systems. So the Asian Trauma Research Team is uh, now uh, starting to share uh, what's happening for the last two years and how can we overcome the current status. And from this meeting, uh, could you get some inspiration for research? And then could you share your idea and uh, to improve your system? Uh, and we can uh, develop our new concept of the trauma care system and research from this meeting. So thank you very much again. And then uh, we'll have a good dinner tonight. So could you join everybody? So welcome. Thank you very much. So uh, we are starting uh, our uh, research workshop from the session one. Uh, the session one uh, will uh, discuss about the trauma database of the Asian countries. Uh, there, uh, there is two chairs in this session, uh, Dr. <coughs> Dehan Wee and Dr. Satar Yapan will be the chair of this uh, session. Originally, Dr. Li Bao Hui from uh, Vietnam will be a chair of this session, but he has some uh, situation, so he could not come to South Korea. So uh, Dr. Dehan Wee will uh, replace uh, the, uh, the seat of Li Bao Hui. Uh, Dr. Dehan Wee is uh, the chair of Patus uh, Coordination Center and also working in the Wonggang University Sambon Hospital in South Korea as an emergency physician. And uh, Dr. Sata uh, Ryapan is a uh, national uh, PI and site PI of the Thailand, and he is working in the Syria hospital. Uh, please. Let me introduce Professor Sabari uh, Faiza Zana Kudin in Malaysia. Uh, Dr. Sabaria graduated from the University of Alexandria in 1984. 
and received her master in anesthesia in 1991 and has been in emergency medicine since 1996. She was awarded the Fellow of Academy of Medicine Malaysia in 2016. Uh, he currently serves as the Professor of the Emergency Medicine at the University Technology MARA. And she currently serves as present, President of the Malaysian Research Station Association. Please welcome she with a big round. Thank you, Dr. Wee, for the kind, kind introduction. A very, good af a very good afternoon, everybody. It's really good to be back uh, in uh, Seoul, Korea and to meet up with the Patas family again after about more than two and a half years. <clears throat> oh. All right. I'll be talking about the trauma database overview uh, in Malaysia and just a short overview of the trauma cases in uh, trauma in Malaysia and how we set up our trauma with uh, uh, trauma database. It's mainly a story about how we developed our trauma database. The trauma database in Malaysia is not as robust uh, we, uh, as compared to the other uh, countries who we're presenting today. So we've, we've just started off our trauma registry and um, and uh, hope that from, from, from your presentation, you can share uh, with Malaysia how to improve our trauma, data, trauma database. <clears throat> uh, this was an old data because this is uh, our reason why we feel that we should have a national uh, trauma database. Our case fatality index is still very high at that particular point in time. I don't think it has decreased by then, and we have about in 2007, uh, 6,282 deaths per year. So that's a lot. And it, the, the, the number seems to be stabilizing about 6,000, 7,000 every year <clears throat> up to this year. So we do recognize that if we have, we need a good trauma system. And one of the, uh, one of the elements of the trauma system is to have a good uh, quality improvement program. And among them will be the trauma registry. So we, we think that since a uh, major trauma is a cause of death or mobility in Malaysia and it's a major disease burden. And if, if we can have uh, prevention of injury, that would, that would be better in lowering the trauma mortality and mobility. And uh, there's evidence that if we correct the, the uh, and, uh, resuscitation patient early, definitely the measure will result in better outcome. And in Malaysia, at that particular point in time, there's a lack of outcome studies on a national scale. <clears throat> the, the, the Malaysian uh, annual report in 2000, uh, in the 2000, uh, says that the third most common emission and the fifth common death in Malaysia, it seems to stabilize about the fifth most common death in Malaysia up to now. So there's a lot of discussion about to set up the, the, the trauma, trauma registry or some sort of trauma, uh, uh, surveillance. So the discussion started from 20, 2001. There was a, a injury prevention, so consultancy report, and from that there was attempt to have a national injury surveillance uh, to be done in the country. But they found that to do the national uh, injury surveillance was a very big task that at that point in time they cannot carry it out. So there's a proposal for to set up the national trauma base in 2005, but it's on a research basis to start off with, and therefore uh, we received the um, major research grant for for three years to do the study. So basically, the first the first uh, major trauma data uh, the, the national trauma database in Malaysia was basically a research grant. The uh, national trauma uh, database in Malaysia uh, set up with as a government's unit, as a government's committee that oversees. Uh, uh, the, the steering committee. So, so the steering committee decides what are the data variables that you need while the governments make sure that we do it in a proper way and we do have some lay pe people in our government's unit. Uh, the registry managers runs, uh, look over the, the data and that, that goes to the, uh, hospital sites. So we started the data collection first in 2006 and the last collection in 2009. So it's a, a very short period of time. And at that particular time, again, very, very few hospitals. There's about 
two, four, six, but eight hospitals. By the, by the time 2009, we had hit hospitals. When we started off, we had only five hospitals in a trauma database. So therefore, it does not actually uh, represent a population-based uh, uh, trauma injury. <clears throat> Our inclusion criteria was those who died from injuries after admission, the severe injuries of IS, uh, of IS as more than 15, those, in, uh, those uh, admitted to intensive care unit, mechanically ventilated, urgent surgery with 24 hours, and those with severe injury. Basically, our, dat our data variables and our indications uh, we do follow quite closely the Vic Victoria Trauma Outcome Study when we first started uh, this because we did not have anybody else to in our, re uh, in our region at a particular point uh, to look into. Right, so this is the data collection form that we have, right? So it's uh, quite, it's, it's not that many, it's, it's quite very, it's quite similar to Pathos. The data is collected and entered into the case report form. Then from that is entered into, into a web-based uh, uh, web system where, and then the, uh, from, from the data entered, the patients who do not meet the criteria will be removed from the national trauma data bank. So in, in the space of about three years, we have about 3,865 patients. So not, not, not many. And remember, these patients are just the, 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 tra the major trauma patients. So therefore, uh, unlike Pathos, uh, where we took all the patients that's proper ambulances, these are just major trauma patients. So this is the website that, that we enter the patient. Again, very similar to what Pathos has now. Uh, we can enter the, the, the data. Just, just a drop-down box, or we just or on the, um, or on or on this. I think they call it a circle uh, point. Okay, so from that we came out with uh, four, and we managed to come out four four annual reports from the initial uh, trauma <coughs> national trauma database, and um, this is just a snapshot of of what we have. So in since two thousand nine, because that's where more sites are there and then we we had also additional funding from the from the uh, Malaysian Institute of Road, Road Traffic Accident uh, that support us for 2009 so we could get in more more hospitals inside um, the again exclusively a male <laughs> disease trauma in Malaysia they usually the young they usually the young patients if you can see there uh, the age group again Unlike uh, in Korea, in UK, and in Japan, we still uh, a disease of the young. Uh, again, more than seventy-five percent is is the road traffic accident. This is the two thousand nine data. It's a road traffic accident, and being the, being on the motorcycle is the one that that is going to hurt you and kill you, right? Most injuries uh, again head and neck, and uh, most of the injury services caused between the sixteen to twenty-five. Um, Sixty percent of this patient managed to get an ICU bed, even though most of them would require some form of ICU or high dependency unit. If we if we look at the previous data, uh, there's less patients actually in ICU, but there's improvement over 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 the the, the three years. And unfortunately, we still have about thirty percent of our patients who succumb uh, from major trauma in Malaysia at that part uh, in two thousand nine. So the issues at that particular time, which I think is, remains the same if we were to do it again now, is there's no dedicated data uh, collector, not collector, no, no dedicated data collector. So we, we use the same nurses or the same paramedics or even doctors to help us collect the data. So, so sometimes there'll be, there'll be cases that are missed and um, uh, data that's not being uh, entered and uh, not being uh, of high quality so with missing and incomplete data. Again, a lot of under-reporting cases when we miss the cases and then the accuracy of AIS. Uh, AIS uh, we do have uh, uh, the quality uh, and the registry imaginer looking at, looking, looking at the quality of it like what Pathos has. But again, um, the, the across across the country, the level of training and knowledge of AIS might be a bit different. And again, uh, the National Trauma Database do not have uh, many uh, centers. So because of lack of funds, because this is a government-sponsored spon clinical research program, they decided not to continue our funding. Um, as anything, when the when the economy goes down, 
for us, one of the first things that get cut is our research money. But so we ended up in 20, 2019, but uh, in 2010 to 2015, that's our, our, our tenth Malaysia plan. Malaysia ha puts up a five year plan every five years. So during the tenth Malaysia plan in 2010 to 2015, the trauma services in the country do put up certain requirements that we need. And one of the requirements is because, again, uh, there's lack of trauma data, even though we had the trauma database, but again, uh, that was uh, quite minimal and not continuing. So uh, the, one of the factors that, other than these 10 factors, is that, that, that we do require some sort of trauma registry uh, to collect data on the trauma patients. But they continue to sleep on it, not, not doing anything very much on the 10th Malaysian plan, but on the starting on the 11th Malaysia plan, uh, it got resuscitated a bit. So they look at the Malaysian Trauma Performance Technical Report. So one of the things that they, they do use our trauma uh, national database to come up with their, with their performance uh, indicators that they looked. And they looked at others, uh, 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 other 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 countries' databases, they want to try to benchmark uh, about the trauma care in Malaysia. So they did look at, uh, at that particular time, Patos in 2010, uh, this is 2016, thing. so Patos was already uh, um, already in Malaysia, so they, they do look at all these um, countries and all these papers to come up with a benchmarking <coughs> for Malaysia. All right, so, but it just ended there. They benchmark and then they continue to sleep on it. So we, <laughs> Malaysia entered uh, Patos in 2016, 2022. So, uh, so there's a gap between 2009 and 2016. So at least 2016, to continue our trauma registry, we embark on, on, on to be member of, of the Patos community. So uh, even though, even though uh, the, the trauma data, database was quite some time ago, but we do realize that that we do need some some sort of an organized trauma care over in the country. So the surgeons came out with a policy uh, to come uh, for the Minister of Health, that, that they are for the surgical trauma policy in 2016. While we in the emergency uh, department uh, fraternity in 2017 came out with a fellowship program uh, with the University of Technology Mara, the university I, I am in, to, to develop the Emergency Trauma Care Fellowship Program. So that has been quite successful at the moment. I think we have uh, five trauma physicians and another, uh, we, we have about uh, five trauma physicians uh, and about, about four or five, another four or five in training. So this helps to complement the trauma surgical program that we have. But again, this is very, again, very hospital based, not in the community and uh, little, little input from the pre-hospital care. So the surgeons came out with their own program, the emergency physicians came out with their program. We seem typical of Ministry of Health, we tend to work in silos. So we decide to break that silo and to come up with a blueprint or proposal for the Malaysian trauma care system. Um, so this is the framework that we have, um, develop effective trauma care system, integrating the care of an injured patient from the time of injury uh, to the return of to the society, effective uh, emergency care at the emergency department and the other uh, areas of the hospital, follow up rehabilitation and reintegrating into society and ongoing training of the, the uh, related um, professionals. This is what we envision. Again, it's a trauma chain of survival that we have, uh, early activation, pre-hospital care, which is, we, we, we know that at this point in time already after more than 10 years that pre-hospital trauma care becomes very important to have some trauma life support, emergency, surgical and good care, definitive care and return to rehabilitation and practicing um, what uh, other countries do, sending the right patient to the right hospital, not necessarily to the nearest hospital practicing a trauma bypass system. So we, we do in, try to integrate the, the surgical system and the emergency care system and have all the uh, stakeholders together, the radiologists, the anesthesia, and, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and those uh, involved in uh, trauma care. 
because we still do need a registry, decided to embark on the Malaysian Trauma, trauma Registry um, in, in, in uh, starting from 2018. The talk was there about reviving because the Minister of Health from initially, the registries were under as part of clinical research. The Minister of Health decided that the, all the registries in Malaysia should be under their health informatics uh, department, right? And if uh, and then in order for us to stake our claim uh, to have the registry uh, under the Ministry of Health, uh, we, we do say that it's an impo it's in, in, important part of the sustainable development goals of the uh, WH and to reduce the road traffic uh, mortality by 50% in uh, 20, uh, 2030. Uh, it's a hard task for us, but we need to collect the data to show that whether we have done it or not. So the National Trauma this Database rise from the ashes, <laughs> like a phoenix rise from the ashes. Right, so uh, we developed the Malaysian Trauma Trauma Registry. And then it has, I think from the experience, it has better organization um, uh, and which again include the, the from injury prevention to pre-hospital trauma care, clinical care, the administrative component, the training component and rehabilitation and post-discharge care. So you, they follow the patients right from the pre-hospital care or the, or the community right down to the, uh, back to the community of this patient. So they have uh, um, uh, their, their, their organization that covers the governance and, this, and the operation. And this is currently led by Dr. Uh, Shah Jahan. He's unable to come today because he has, again, something on in in uh, Thailand. Everybody has something on in Thailand at this point in time. <laughs> right? Okay, Dr. Sata, something's very active in Thailand. So he's come, come, uh, he, he can't make it today. I have a very uh, interesting discussion with him. So the Mission Trauma Registry, they start thinking about 2018 and we started our first data entry into April 2021. And uh, 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 still, still, so it's still, it's still very, uh, still very early part of it. So they include only patients uh, that is uh, in the red zone and uh, any trauma death in hospitals. They have like pathos, core data, extended data, and they have many, 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 many pages. <laughs> right. Okay. So it's a bit more comprehensive. So they have 20 hospitals at the, at the particular moment. Because we have started the Malaysian Trauma Registry, uh, Malaysia has decided to stop uh, contrib contributing data to PATOS at this particular time in time, but we will, PATOS will work together with Malaysian Trauma Registry to be able to collaborate together and uh, share the data with PATOS uh, so that the, the Malaysian contribution to trauma care still continues. It's a long road ahead. Uh, I think from, from the time we started in uh, 2006, but I think it's worth it. Thank you very much, Kapsamida. Uh, professor Marcus Ong is Professor, Director of Health Service and System Research at Duke NUS Medical School, and also Director of Pre-Hospital and Emergency Research Center. Uh, senior Consultant and Clinician, clinician Scientist, <coughs> Department of Emergency Medicine, Singapore General Hospital. He also holds appointment in Singh Health Ministry of Health, Singapore, local and also academic institute. Please welcome. Thank you, Dr. Wee. It's my privilege to share with you a little bit about our journey uh, with our National Trauma Registry in Singapore. So trauma in Singapore ranks number five as a cause of death after cancer, heart disease, pneumonia, and cerebrovascular disease. Um, and you, as you can see, the trend has been actually a decreasing mortality rate over the last uh, 10 years. So one of the things we say is a trauma surgeon in Singapore will starve. But that's not exactly true. When you look at what are the 10, top 10 causes of admissions to hospitals, uh, then you see actually a, quite a different picture. And number one is actually accidents, poisoning, and injuries. 
Um, and so while it may not be a major driver of mortality in Singapore, trauma certainly is a major driver of hospitalization and admissions. And if you break this down further, uh, then the uh, picture becomes a little bit more clear. Um, in terms of, for example, road traffic injuries, assault, um, these have been declining over the last decade in Singapore. Singapore, we always say very safe. You can't drive very fast, must wear seat belt, no guns. You know, if you get caught with a knife, you know, it's a long prison sentence. Um, but what has been increasing, interestingly, are falls. And these are not necessarily the fall from height. They are actually uh, same level falls or low level falls uh, suffered by actually elderly patients. So that is uh, something unique about Singapore. What is the role of the trauma registry? I think all of us are very familiar with it. Uh, it provides a very vital resource for planning, for quality improvement, for research. And in Singapore, this is funded and supported by the Ministry of Health. We have a National Trauma Committee, which I have sat on for the last 10 years, that has representatives from the hospitals, from academia, from various disciplines. So not just the trauma surgeons, but also em emergency physicians, public health, etc. And then we also have a National Trauma Unit, which is uh, situated in the Tan Tock Seng Hospital. Uh, and basically, they help coordinate the trauma registry. So we started uh, the concept of the trauma registry in 20, uh, 2008 uh, with the first appointment of the NTC. And uh, we started collecting data about uh, 6 to 12 months later. Um, later on, I'll show you how the trauma registry works, but there's uh, two other important roles that we've had over the last decade. So one is actually introducing core trauma standards, where we initially came together as a consensus process, uh, agreed on what are the criteria in, for trauma care and trauma quality, and then we actually put in place an accreditation and now it's an audit uh, process where every public hospital in Singapore has to undergo a trauma certification and based on that they can be assigned the various levels of their trauma capability um, and second is that uh, we have actually put in place now a national kind of trauma bypass or regionalization kind of strategy where instead of bringing every trauma case to the nearest hospital which used to be the case uh, we now have criteria for trauma triage and sending the major trauma case to a trauma designated trauma center uh, and bypassing the nearest hospital. So, um, how should you craft a, a trauma registry? I think it depends on your goals. And we have stated three goals for our National Trauma Registry. Number one, to reduce the societal impact of trauma. And that means that you need to have data that reflects the incidence and severity of trauma as a disease. What is the economic burden, meaning that you have to collect data on quality of life and the uh, kind of economic uh, cost effectiveness and impact, as well as of obviously mortality and morbidity. Our second aim is to improve injury uh, prevention, which means that you need detailed information on the cause of trauma and the key processes. And finally, you want to re improve your trauma system response, both pre-hospital, in the acute hospital and in the rehab, which means that you need to get data from these three domains, both of the baseline condition what are the key processes as well as patient outcomes. And so these are the inclusion criteria for Singapore NTR. Uh, but by and large, uh, the emergency ambulances will only bring uh, cases to the public hospitals. So we only collect uh, data from our public hospitals, starting from the ambulance service, the emergency department, and it's actually uh, triggered off by the diagnosis codings. So if there's a trauma diagnosis, basically, uh, we have mapped this into ICD-10 and SNOMED as well, and that gets pulled into our trauma registry. And so, of course, this is based on the assumption that, you know, all major trauma or trauma of uh, significance is actually attended by our single public ambulance service and is brought to a public hospital, which means that we do not get data from the private hospitals. Singapore has also been organized into a regional health system, which means that the country is divided into three administrative kind of uh, regions, each of which has a linkage of data from 
primary care, secondary care, uh, step-down care to community-based care. And this has uh, a big bearing on how the trauma registry works and will work in the future, as I'll uh, explain later. So what happens is that um, data is automatically pulled from our public hospital electronic medical records and our data warehouses. We do have trauma coordinators that are cited in each of the eight public hospitals. And their job is actually um, manually verifying the injury coding. And of course, uh, hospital records would not have your AIS, ISS, etc. So that is where the coordinators come in. And then the data goes into our integrated trauma uh, server. Uh, we also pull in data from the ambulance service through the SCDF. And this is how we actually uh, sort of like sort the data. As you know, there's tier one to tier five. So we are mainly focusing on the tier one, two, and three cases, meaning fatal injuries, injuries resulting in hospitalizations. But we also collect data from injuries resulting in visits to the emergency departments. And this goes into our national trauma registry. So it's not just major trauma, but any trauma that results in an emergency department visit. However, the tier fours and the fives, which are injuries treated in primary care and those outside the health system, they are not reported. Now, regarding the data categories, you can see on the right, uh, I think Dr. Sabari has also gone through. This more or less aligns well with the PATHOS data fields of collection uh, from demographics, injury, epidemiology, pre-hospital care, the acute care, the system outcomes, as well as rehabilitation. And as uh, I've noted, we do follow up our patients. Uh, we do uh, things like disability assessment, quality of life assessment. And for a small subset of them, we've actually done sort of like a, um, more patient reported outcomes and uh, quality of life interviews. Okay, and then we come up with an annual national trauma report, which is first presented at the National Trauma Committee. And after that, it's actually made into public record. So you can actually go into it. And of course, there's some media release as well as public messaging that is related to this. And every hospital is represented by their trauma director in the National Trauma Committee and has a say on the National Trauma Report. Um, oh yeah, the slide at the bottom is just to show that, you know, we have actually seen a... Uh, 20 to 30 percent drop in the last three years in our trauma volumes that's been related to COVID and lockdown. But as I've mentioned earlier in the morning, what we've seen in the last few months is the trauma cases are coming back. And more disturbingly is that we have seen quite an uh, increase in the number of fatalities at work sites. And we think that is related to a shortage of manpower, you know, uh, firms that are trying to rush their jobs and trying to meet deadlines. And so we've seen lapses in safety kind of standards and this has resulted in some deaths. Okay, so a little bit about the uh, data backbone uh, behind it. So um, as I mentioned, each of the three regional uh, health systems has a common kind of IT infrastructure. So every night as you're sleeping, my servers are actually pulling data from primary care, uh, the acute hospitals, the tertiary care, community step-down care, and it's put into a data grid, a national kind of data grid. Um, and that is where we actually can layer on our analytics tools. We can mine them according to the ISS coding. And so we have been able to reduce a lot of the manual uh, labor involved in pulling this kind of registry data. And we reserve our manpower for, as I've mentioned, you know, looking at the AIS, ISS, and the kind of things that uh, so far we've not been able to automate yet. Now, the next step of this is actually linking this to pre-hospital data. And um, also, how do we share data across nationally? And this is where I want to introduce the MCDR. This is the MOH Central Data Repository. So this is a kind of government platform where we pull in data, not just from health, but we can pull in road traffic information, home affairs, police, security, demographic planning. And this is put into a common data space that all government officers can uh, access, as well as used for planning, for simulation modeling, for analytics, etc. Now, if we uh, move down, besides MCDR, we have the brain. Brain is basically the, uh, a shadow or, or a replica of MCDR for the healthcare family. So information that's specific for health is actually put into brain. And this is accessible by all our public hospitals, 
uh, through their, their users. And then finally, there's trust, which is an open platform for collaboration with academia, for universities, researchers, international collaboration or collaboration with pharmaceutical and industries, for example. And this extends to how we have tried to link our ambulance data, which is now on Samsung Galaxy tabs. So they, are, they have their own electronic record. And this is a system that we call Omni, which is uh, now in the process of linkage with Ministry of Health Hospital Outcomes data. Hello, Of course, in Hollywood, everyone survives. But uh, that's not science fiction. This Omni has actually gone live for the last one year. 
Of course, we have had some initial challenges with the implementation, but by and large, the tablets are working well. The ambulance uh, services have been using that and it's linking with our national electronic records. So happy to talk through if you're interested in any of those uh, details. The last segment, uh, last few minutes, just want to focus a bit on what can be done with data. So this is an example of a project that I've just completed recently called Virtual Singapore. The idea is that uh, we are mapping Singapore in 3D. So, you know, most maps are 2D, but doesn't cover underground spaces, you know, inside the shopping malls, inside buildings, or, you know, for example, the external and built environment. And we've been flying drones, we've been having people walk around with the, the Google camera, you know, mapping indoor spaces. And we now actually have a simulation model of uh, most parts of Singapore called Virtual Singapore. And the idea was to find use cases of how we can leverage off 3D uh, mapping to be able to actually help emergency response. So we came up with three use cases. We built a training game for disaster management. So this, uh, in a way, can replace a lot of the large-scale exercises or tabletop kind of disaster exercise that we do, and we can do it in a virtual game instead. Uh, we actually built a simulation model of the emergency department, including their flows through the work areas, looking at loads, and then uh, the initial use case was of how to evacuate in a case of fire, but we actually converted that to a use case for COVID and planning for uh, COVID resourcing. And then finally, we have a project that we delivered on AED placement optimization. How can you place AEDs in the different parts of Singapore to have maximum survival? Okay, what are the challenges uh, that we have seen uh, moving forward? Um, of course, hospital bypass means that hopefully you send the right patient to the right place, but it also means ambulances have to travel further and there's an increased ambulance uh, time and turnaround. And this becomes a problem when you have increasing ambulance volumes and uh, issues with uh, kind of volume surge. And part of that is how do you define a major trauma patient? Who gets diverted? Who doesn't? A lot of the trauma skills, as we know, have limitations. And so we are working on, you know, for example, using AI and a better kind of triaging to help us with decision making. And if you get it wrong, again, you may end up with uh, increased inter-hospital transfers, you know, and again, that wastes time and that takes up resources. Bed availability is still a challenge, especially with post-COVID kind of surge in the chronic patients that are coming back. Uh, and how do you distribute that load uh, equally? And finally, I think manpower is one of the biggest challenge. Um, you know, how do we help uh, have adequate staffing and even in a specialized area like trauma, you know, tr getting surgeons to do trauma as a specialty is, is a challenge in our part of the world. Um, we've also learned that injury is more than one disease. You know, of course, we know about blunt and penetrating injury and they are quite different. And in Singapore, it's mainly blunt. We see very little penetrating injury, which means that again, when we do get a case, whether we have the expertise, experience, you know, and confidence to be able to manage that penetrating trauma can be an issue. I hinted at the high velocity versus low velocity uh, kind of problem, right? And we realized that in Singapore, uh, unlike uh, what the, Dr. Sabaria was saying, trauma is a disease of the young. In Singapore, trauma is a disease of the old. <laughs> we are mainly seeing elderly falls, you know, with uh, multiple injuries and complex medical problems at the same time. And so data collection priorities may differ based on, you know, your disease mix, your outcome measures are different, you know. So again, it's not enough just to say survive or die, right? But we want to know survive with what quality of life, with what disability, and how many years of life after that uh, can you expect? So uh, let's dive a little bit deeper into uh, low falls, you know, and if you follow the pure ISS definition more than nine, there's this intersection where if it's a low fall, the patient is elderly above 65, and for example, they have a hip fracture, it actually classifies as major injury, more than nine. Um, and in fact, what we have done is we've looked at our data and uh, it starts as early as 55. Um, and what kind of falls are we talking about? Most of them are in the home. Uh, and these are things that, again, may have an opportunity for prevention, education, looking at the home environment, etc. cetera. Um, when we match the low fallers from the high fallers, actually very interestingly and counterintuitively, the patients with a low fall actually have a higher 12-month mortality compared to the high velocity. Uh, and this, we think, is probably related to their comorbids and their underlying frailty and uh, you know that th this is a disease of the old, whereas the high velocity injuries are diseases of the young. So if they survive the initial injury 
actually the long-term outcomes are poorer for the low fallers. And so there's this unknown base of, uh, you know, uh, of disease at the bottom, but we think that actually we are talking about two different animals. One is the high velocity, our traditional trauma multidisciplinary approach. But then we have now an increasing burden of geriatric multi uh, uh, kind of injuries. And the traditional trauma team approach is not going to work. You know, trauma team activation for 80 year old with a hip fracture doesn't make sense, right? But what they actually need are hip fracture pathways, bring in the physiotherapist for pre-operative conditioning, looking at early rehab, early mobilization, nutrition and all that. So it may require a whole different paradigm and a way of thinking about treating trauma as a disease. Um, and, you know, again, short-term mortality is, uh, you know, what we look for, but in, in the second peak of geriatric trauma, actually what you're looking at is long-term mortality and processes of care. And if you look at, for example, road traffic injuries versus elderly fallers at home, you know, again, the prevention, the intervention is different. You know, in one, you look at seat belt compliance, you know, helmets and everything. Uh, and looking at the uh, road users. The other one is looking at home programs, home environment, you know, uh, who is at risk of falling, can you have uh, fall prevention, screening, rehabilitation, etc. Some other, uh, you know, interesting things that we have done with our trauma data, looking at geospatial analysis, identifying trauma hotspots where, again, there's uh, opportunity to put traffic lights, pedestrian crossing, overhead bridges, and simple things that can reduce the likelihood of you having an accident. Um, we've also uh, published several studies related to PMDs, personal mobility devices. You know, I don't know whether you had that problem in Korea, but we were seeing a spate of all these injuries. And because of the research that we published, uh, the government actually put in place laws and regulations to register PMDs, and we've actually seen a decline in the trauma since then. Um, we have participated in the PICANS, for example, the Pediatric Head Injury Network, and looking at uh, rules for scanning, you know, when should you have a head CT scan for pediatric trauma, uh, and how can you identify the high-risk patients. We've also done some interesting linkage of data, uh, looking at the socioeconomic uh, non-health determinants of outcomes. And uh, in Singapore, there's an interesting phenomenon where we found that the, ho the house that you stay in is a very good proxy for your socioeconomic status. And so by just by looking at your postal code, I actually have an algorithm that will actually give you a score for your socioeconomic uh, housing index. And we found that that's a, a, a pretty good indicator of SES. Um, we've looked at linking, for example, the PAROS data with our trauma registry outcomes, looking at the interface of uh, trauma that leads to arrest. And uh, what was interesting about this study was uh, it highlighted drownings as, again, an area of possible interventions. And this is my last slide. And also, again, just to give you an idea of what can be done with data, uh, we have done studies on seat belt use uh, and non-compliance. What are the risk factors and how do you intervene? Um, we've looked at, for example, do you need to modify the injury severity score uh, for pediatric patients, for geriatric patients, for low fallers. And we found that actually ISS, as you know, is a very blunt instrument. A lot more research can be done to improve that as a tool. Uh, we've looked at long-term outcomes and functional outcomes of patients after trauma. Uh, and frailty, again, is an area of, uh, of interest for us to actually uh, look at how can you uh, improve conditioning of patients, you know, before and after traumatic injuries. So with that, you know, um, we hope to put the patient at the center, be able to put in place an alliance of the clinician, the policymaker, and the community, make use of data in a virtuous cycle to actually have a cycle of improvement, and bring in tools from the various, various realms of science, you know, whether that's informatics, statistics, uh, epidemiology, but also economics, you know, uh, sociology, decision modeling, and be able to actually make things better with our system. With that, thank you very much. The, the trauma database implementation and digitalization in Asian countries. And now we have the two countries left. So let me the representative from South Korea. My friend, Dr. Jong Ho Park, he is clearly is a clinical uh, associate professor, Department of Emergency Medicine, Seoul National University Hospital, which is specialized in the EMS medicine. And he also the senior researcher in laboratory of the EMS. Seoul National University Hospital.
please welcome Dr. Park. Okay, thank you, Sata. Hello, I am Jung Woo Park from Seoul National University Hospital. I will talk about trauma database implementation and utilization in South Korea. Uh, first, I will talk about hospital-based trauma registries in Korea. And next, I will talk about community-based severe trauma registry project in Korea. Uh, Korea National Hospital Discharge Index Injury Survey is the uh, one of important hospital-based injury database in Korea. This database was started from 2005, and it is similar to National Hospital Care Survey in the United States. Uh, among all injury patients who visited the hospital with more than 100 beds, the systematic sampling of hospital was conducted. So all, among all 572 hospitals, 220 hospitals were sampled. And after hospital sampling, the 9% of patient sampling also conducted for systematically to represent, uh, to estimate the nationwide uh, statistics. So in, in one year, almost 318,000 cases they, uh, were collected using this survey and uniform hospital discharge data set including demographics, injury characteristics, diagnosis, operation, and admission results are included. Uh, main result of Korea National Hospital Discharge Index Injury Survey is as follows. In one year, almost 1.1 million people admitted to hospital by injury in Korea. And the incidence of injury is 2,250 per 100,000 population. And among them, trauma is 76.4%. And four is the most common admitted injury mechanism. The incidence rate is 860 per 100,000. And the next is traffic accident and other blunt injury and penetrating injury uh, shows uh, this result. So this is yearly trend of number of discharged injury patients per 100,000 population. The blue line is four and red line is traffic accidents. As you see, the incidence of four is increasing in these days and incidence of traffic accident is decreasing from 2012. The limitation of Korean National Hospital Discharge Index Injury Registry is follows. Uh, as this registry can represent all nationwide statistics, but this registry does not represent any specific region of Korea. So comparison between region is not possible with this registry. And because this registry is hospital-based registry, so only patients who were admitted hospital are included. So uh, people who died in emergency department is not included. And those patients are actually most severe trauma patients. And this registry also lacks pre-hospital information. The EMS use or not is not collected. And there is no injury severity information. Although we can estimate injury severity using diagnostic code, it is not accurate. Uh, next database in Korea I will talk about is Korea Trauma Data Bank. It is similar to National Trauma Data Bank in the United States. It was started from 2013. And in Korea, Trauma Center designation was started from 2012. And five trauma centers were designated at that time. And now, uh, 17 trauma centers are designated in Korea. Uh, all trauma patients who were not discharged from ED are included. So uh, patients who were admitted or patients who, uh, patient who were transported to another hospital or patients who were dead in the emergency department are included. And demographic, injury characteristics, survival outcome, and hospital process including trauma team activation, transfusion imaging, and injury severity score, and some of the pre-hospital information and Glasgow outcome scale at discharge are collected. Uh, main result of KTDB is follows. In uh, 2019, uh, 37,000 patients visited trauma center. And among them, 64% of patients directly visited to trauma center. And 35% of patients were transported from another hospital to trauma center. 
uh, among them, uh, 49% of patients used EMS, and HEMS helicopter use cases was 2.3%. The injury severity score categories as follows. Uh, 8,892 uh, patients, 24% uh, uh, of patients are uh, have injury severity score more than 15, so they are severe trauma patients. So among these 8,892 severe trauma cases, 58% uh, directly visited to trauma center, and 55% used EMS, and total in hospital mortality is 17.3%. Uh, the limitation of KTDB is as follows. Because in Korea, actually, trauma center coverage is still low. Therefore, uh, it could not represent any specific region. Uh, actually, in Seoul, uh, designated trauma center is not opened yet. So the no regional representation is one of the important limitations of KTDB. And for when you analyze pre-hospital data, for EMS-assessed severe trauma patients, only 29% uh, of patients visited trauma centers. So most of uh, severe trauma patients are, are treated in non-trauma center in Korea. And because it, this is trauma center-based race 3, there is no data for non-trauma center visited patient. And this race 3 also lacks some pre-hospital information. And data is only available for, uh, for researchers in a trauma center. So it is also another limitation. So there were these four new trauma database in Korea in early 2010s. So uh, we need database for trauma system evaluation, not for trauma center evaluation. And because in severe trauma patient, the pre-hospital management is very important. So pre-hospital trauma response system should also be evaluated, especially for severe trauma. And comprehensive pre-hospital data and incidence location information was also needed. And there were also need for database with regional representativeness. As you know, environmental and social circumstances related to trauma is different according to the region, and it is uh, it is main main data for the new preventive strategy for region by region. So the regional representative data were needed. So in 2011, uh, Dr. Shin and Korean CDC developed another form of race tree in Korea. Uh, we have also ups and downs of this race tree, and now we call this race tree as community-based severe trauma race tree. This is also some, some form of Phoenix race tree in Korea, like Malaysia. Uh, the database design is as follows. This is complete enumeration survey for EMS treated severe injury patient. So we, uh, we, we don't sample any patient. We include all patients, uh, who were, uh, who were EMS treated severe injury. And so this database has county level representativeness. Uh, we can compare data. Uh, county by county. And because this race tree was started from pre-hospital, so this database includes instant location information and comprehensive pre-hospital information. But in this data, we patients who visited non-government designated emergency department are excluded. So only patients who visited uh, government designated emergency department are included. This database was started from 2012, and pilot trial for two regions were conducted in 2012, and the pilot trial for six regions was conducted in 2013, and 10 regions were uh, conducted in 2014. Uh, after one year stop, all nationwide survey for first visited hospital information was conducted in 2016. This was the first nationwide uh, nationwide data collection for this kind of race tree. And after the, the post because of the budget or other administrative thing, 
this registry was not continued, but from 2019, this registry was resuscitated and national survey was restarted. And in this time, we collect um, data with, with second hospital information for patients who transported from ED in first visiting hospital. So this re rest project is led by Dr. Song in Borame Medical Center from 2019. The inclusion criteria for community-based severe trauma rest project is as follows. Uh, uh, although the, the name of rest included uh, severe trauma, this rest is not just for severe trauma. Uh, we collect all EMS-assessed severe injury cases. Uh, we define EMS provider's assessment of severe injury as follows. When patient showed abnormal revised trauma score at the scene, the, the patient are classified to severe injury. The revised, abnormal revised trauma score is when a systolic blood pressure was under 90 mercury, millimeter mercury, or patient non-alert, or patient respiratory rate was under 10 or over 29, those patients were classified to abnormal RTS cases and all of abnormal RTS patients are included in our registry. And second, uh, in Korean EMS providers used United States CDC field triage decision scheme for trauma center transport candidate identification. So in that criteria, if a patient met Patient met trauma center transport to candidate, uh, candidate criteria, the Korean EMS provider should record EMS in-depth trauma registry. So if EMS in-depth trauma registry is recorded, those patients are also included. And in addition, we also collect multi-casualty incident cases. When one incident occurred, but six or more ambulance responses was needed, we collect all of those cases. Uh, yeah. So this is United States Field Triage Decision Scheme, and some of you are familiar with this. So the major groups of our community-based severe trauma rest project is as follows. First, uh, EMS Assessed Severe Trauma Candidate Group is important group. Uh, for patients who showed abnormal RTS at the scene, or for patients who met trauma center transport candidate for field triage decision scheme are included in this group. And because of this, the injury severity, uh, injury severity range can be from one to 74, uh, 75. So all injury severity can be possible. So among them, the EMS-based severe, severe trauma group is also identified. Uh, among EMS assessed severe trauma candidate group, injury severity score more than 15, or patient with out of hospital cardiac arrest or death on arrival at ED were included in this severe trauma group. Because of the fatality, the, the DOA cases or out of hospital cardiac arrest cases are all in order, even though AIS were not reliably collected for those patients. And, and the third group is EMS assessed non-traumatic severe injury patient. For non-traumatic injury patient, if patient showed abnormal RTS at the scene, those patients are all included. The, the last group is EMS assessed multi-casualty incident group. And there is no severity, severity criteria for this group. So uh, most of patients are, are mild cases, actually. The main result of our community-based severe trauma rest is as follows. In 2019, 60,000 cases were candidate for a survey and 97.8% of medical record review was conducted. And from this, we can use uh, 56,000 cases uh, can be analyzed um, among uh, 30, 6,900 severe trauma candidate group, uh, 9,115 9, severe trauma patients were identified, and 13,000 non-traumatic severe injury group, 
and 6,800 multi casualty incident group were also identified this race tree. And because this race tree has a county level representativeness, we can compare incidence or incidence rate of each region by this race tree. And the case fatality rate by region is as follows, because in, in severe trauma patients, the, the injury severity is very high, very high and uh, uh, almost 52% of fatality were shown, and disability rate by region is also very high. This is the proportion of traffic accidents among severe trauma patients by region. As you see, uh, the, the proportion of traffic accidents is also different region by region. And this is the double score according to first visiting hospitals. And using the, with the prediction model for the survivor, we can estimate uh, how, how many people can more survived by the first visiting hospital level. And we can identify that when, when patients visited to trauma center, those patients were more chance to survive. The strengths and weakness of community-based severe trauma race tree is as follows. The strength is this race tree has regional representativeness. And this race tree has comprehensive pre-hospital information. And this race tree also includes second hospital information for emergency department transport patient. And because Korean CDC, uh, Korean CDC is a specialized medical record reviewer collect all data, the consistent data collection is possible. And this data is openly um, publicly available, and this is one of the strengths of this race tree. The weakness of this race tree is as follows. This race tree only included EMS assessed patient. And if patient visit non-government designated ED, the cases are excluded, but, but the number of those patients are very small. And EMS provide assessment could be different according to region or according to year. So in some year, the sensitivity for EMS provide assessment for severe trauma could be increased, or some year, uh, those sensitivity could be decreased. And this basically is retrospective design, and there is also limited to identifying some specific improvement points. Uh, when we discuss case by case by by many people, uh, we can identify some specific improvement point, but this race tree is collected by all, all nation widely, so there could be some uh, limitation. So this race tree is not perfect, but very efficient and useful database for trauma system evaluation in Korea. Uh, this is, uh, we, uh, we started the severe trauma workshop for EMS quality improvement in December 2021. Uh, using the community-based severe trauma registry, we calculated some quality indicator, uh, and this, this workshop is for, for the feedback of EMS providers. The host was National Fire Agency and Korean CDC, and organization, or, organizer at Seoul National University Hospital. So six months based the regular workshop was continued and second workshop was conducted in July 2022. And we conducted this workshop in honor prime base. And you can always see Dr. Ju Jung's excellent presentation in this workshop. The summary is as follows. For, for the trauma system evaluation, uh, the hospital based database had limitation in, in the Korean setting because, because trauma center is not so, so prevalent in Korea. So in, in existing hospital-based registry, uh, the, the pre-hospital and injury severity information is somewhat lacking. So the, it is somewhat limitation of our existing registry. So the community-based severe trauma registry was started from 2012, and this registry is now stabilized, stabilized after 2019. So we can collect community, EMS, and hospital information at the same time, and this registry 
uh, can be used as an efficient way to evaluate the trauma system. Okay, thank you. So now we, we're gonna move on to the, the, the RASP center of this session. So uh, Dr. Wen Chu Sheng, Dr. Wen Chu Chong from the Taiwan unit. Uh, so uh, he can, cannot come here at on site, so uh, he's gonna present in, in online. Dr. Wen Chu Chong, he uh, currently is professor of the emergency medicines, National Taiwan University Hospital. Uh, uh, besides of emergency medicine specialty, he is uh, also expertise in the EMS uh, critical care. He is uh, one of the leaders of Taiwan of the EMS system. So please welcome Dr. Wen Chu Chong. Hello everyone, this is Dr. Zhang Wen Chu from Taiwan. I'm very sorry that we cannot meet each other in person in Seoul this time, but I think in the not far future, our Taiwan team will have a chance to meet you in next part of the meeting. My topic today is trauma database implementation and utilization in Taiwan. Currently, there are four trauma databases in Taiwan. The first is the National Health Insurance Data Bank, started since 1995. The data bank, including all the data for patients from all clinics and hospitals for their medical care, therefore there are no pre-hospital data included in this data bank. The second is the Formosan Association of the Surgery and Trauma registries. The registries is not holded by government systems, so the data input to this system, the quality is quite questionable. Currently, there were no any study could be generated from the trauma registry of this system. And the third is Taipei Trauma Registry, holding by Taipei Fire Department since 2016 compare, sorry, collaborating with the PATOS. And currently the data quality is the best of all the trauma research systems in Taiwan. Two years ago, our national fire agencies and the ministries of health and welfare started to establish a big system for whole pre-hospital care and in-hospital care data transfer. I will talk about this later. For the Taipei Fire Department, the trauma data implementation has been for six years. Currently, there are a bi-monthly report in official meetings to discuss the quality of trauma care, including the compliance of EMT to the Taipei Field Tree Age Schemes in the pre-hospital setting and the accuracy of type A field triage skin of every item. We also identified and discussed the potential salvageable patient by the pre-chart, like uh, you see it on the right panel of the slide. The data lines indicating the 50% of chance of survivals by the trees criteria and the index case of D by the red arrows means it is, should be salvageable, but finally death. And we will discuss the case in the pre-hospital setting and in the hospital care for details. In the future, we'd like to start the hospital-based feedback by the Taipei Fire Department, including the trauma M score, Z score, or W score for every hospital. Our government from the National Fire Agency and the Ministries of Health and Welfare also started a big plan by open API, including the TAMSIS and the TAP, SIDRAP, blah, 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 many, many data transfer systems to combine the pre-hospital care and in-hospital care to a whole big blueprint and uh, all the trauma case, cardiac arrest case, 
or some other critical illness like stroke or acute myocardial injuries will be input and connected for their pre-hospital data and in-hospital data. I think this is a big issues, but uh, not that easy to be finished within the next several years. But in the future, it will be a very important issues for the pre-hospital care of critical illness. Regarding the trauma database utilizations, I think the most important things is that we start from the data to generate evidence, then develop our local protocols and start the quality assurance process to improve the data and improve the protocol again. So the previous part is research and the second part is policy. And there is a good circle, an uprighting circle to improve the quality of care for all time sensitive acute illness. Now we will talk about the data to evidence part, the research that we generated in the past three years by collaborations with Pato Systems. The first study we started at the pre-hospital time and the patient's outcome in the Pato's phase one data. There were a total of 24,000 cases from Pato's size from January 2016 to November 2018. We compared the patients with longer pre-hospital time with those of shorter pre-hospital time to see if their 30-day mortality and functional outcome at the charges were different or not. The median age was 45 years old and 63% of them were male. As to the 30-day mortality, the adjust odds ratio per minute for response time, sinks time, and the total pre-hospital time were no significance. But for the poor functional outcome, the adjust odds ratios of response time, sinks time, and the total pre-hospital time every 10 minutes delayed were significantly associated with adverse functional outcome the number as you see here. And all these findings were consistent in many subgroups like different ages, genders, or traumatic brain injury, or ISS, or RTS. And we also show the declining of outcome from the delay of response time since time and total pre-hospital time at right panel. The result is simple. The conclusion is simple. Every 10 minutes delay in total pre-hospital time was significantly associated with a 6% increase in the odds of a poor functional outcome. We then started another study focusing on the in-hospital time to definitive care for patients with trauma. By using phase one and phase two PATHOS data, there were a total of 963 trauma patients receiving trauma surgery or transarterial embolization within two hours after arrival at ER. The outcome is 30-day mortality and functional outcome and hospital discharge. The median time from injury to definitive care in hospital was one and half an hour. And we found a longer interval by every 30 minutes was positively associated with the 30-day mortality rate and poor functional outcome, especially in subgroups of major trauma, traumatic brain injury, and torso injury. And this is the analysis figures of the studies. And conclusion is also simple. Every minute in golden hours in hospital counts for the chance of survival for trauma patients. 
We have also studied at the pre-hospital immobilizations for patients with spinal injury. By using PARTUS Phase 1 data, we identify a total of 759 trauma patients with spinal injury out of a total of 43,000 cases. And we compare the patients with pre-hospital immobilizations to those without pre-hospital immobilizations to see if their favorable functional outcome at the charge were different or not. The subject had a median ages of 58 years and uh, over 57% of them were receiving pre-hospital spinal immobilization. Overall, pre-hospital spinal immobilizations was not associated with favorable functional outcome, but in the subgroup of cervical spinal injury, pre-hospital immobilizations was associated with favorable functional outcome at the charge with adjust odds ratios of 3.14. And here is the analysis figures leading to a conclusion that the paramedic should be more careful when determining the presence of a cervical spinal injury and should apply for spine immobilization if possible. Another study we focus on the pre-hospital fluid administrations on trauma patients. In the PATHOS Phase 1 data of 31,000 trauma patients eligible for this study, we compare the patient with pre-hospital fluid to those without pre-hospital fluid to see their difference in the in-hospital mortality and the pro-functional outcome at hospital discharge. There were a total of 4,318 cases received pre-hospital fluid administrations. We used the propensity score matching method to equalize the potential prognostic factors in both groups. And we found the patients receiving pre-hospital fluid administrations had a higher risk of in-hospital mortality with an adjust odds ratios of 2.02 .02 in the propensity matching analysis. The finding is consistent to the pre-hospital fluid and outcome or pro-functional status with an odds ratios of 1.73 in the propensity model and the significance statistically. This figure shows the consistent trend of the findings among different subgroups. And the conclusion of this article demonstrated that paramedic should be more careful when determining the liberal using of pre-hospital fluid resuscitation. PATHOS Taiwan team also studied the pre-hospital interventions, the frequency and the kind among children in Asia country. By using PATHOS Phase 1 and Phase 2 data, we identified 9,700 pediatric patients aged less than 18 with unintentional injury from October 2015 to December 2020. The study is a descriptive study to identify the characteristic and disease burdens of unintentional injuries among children in Asia. The outcome is pre-hospital interventions, and we also examine the subgroup of different age and stratificated 
by the WHO leveling high income countries, middle income countries, and low income countries. We found that pediatric unintentional injury accounted for 9.4% of all EMS transported trauma cases in the participating ACN centers, and the mortality rate was 0.88%. And this result was similar to those reported in the Western country. The leading cause of injury was traffic accident in older children aged 8 years old, and the falls at home were common among young children aged less than 8. Immobilization was the most common pre-hospital intervention for all children. And we also have an interesting finding that children in the low-income countries and middle-income countries had higher injury severity score and less pre-hospital intervention compared with high-income country children. And this is one of the figures of the studies showing that the interventions in the pre-hospital setting stratified by different ages and uh, country incomes by WHO leveling. The conclusion of this study is that pre-hospital care in pediatric unintentional injury in Asia countries was not standardization and might be insufficient, and the economic status of countries may affect the implementation of pre-hospital care. Currently, Taiwan Patos team have another five proposal or manuscript under submissions or preparation including the pre-hospital blood pressures and patients' outcome, the study on trauma field strategy field simplified scheme, and the study on trauma field scheme using the motor Glasgow coma scale versus total Glasgow coma scale to see to compare their accuracy. We also studied the epidemiology of children abuse and assault in Asia. And we also established a predict model for EMT witness trauma cardiac arrest by using Pato's phase one and phase two data. Thanks to the help from Pato's CRN and the cooperation of all the Pato's sites, we here in Taiwan can establish the Taipei Trauma Registry System six years ago and now have some publication to improve our trauma care systems. We deeply appreciate the help from all our friends from Patos and hope in the not far futures we have the opportunity to say thank yous in person to all of you. Thank you. Xie Come show me that. Okay, we will start uh, session two, the special lecture. Uh, this session will be moderated by Dr. Juo Park. Uh, she is a, a, a professor of emergency, emergency medicine in Harlem University Dongtan Sacred Heart Hospital. And she is also a chair of Patos Data Quality Management Committee. Uh, please, Dr. Park. Thank you for introducing me. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, this is the last session of today, today's program, and I think this can be very valuable uh, session to lead tomorrow's program. So um, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to moderate this session uh, with you. And then uh, I'd like to invite Professor Timothy Coates, right? Yeah. 
<laughs> I'm sorry. Actually, uh, he is uh, already well known among us, so I don't think I need to introduce him to you uh, in detail. He is a chair of the TAN, the, uh, the Trauma Audit and Research Network in uh, Britain. So um, I think sh uh, I think he will give us a very great lecture for our discussion. Okay, I want to turn over the podium to Dr. Coates and please give a welcome, uh, give a give a uh, give him a welcome and thank you. Thank you very much indeed for that welcome and thank you to my friends from Patos for inviting me to come and talk to you today. Um, I'd like to talk about the high quality data collection and management, um, but I'd like to start with giving just an outline of the TARN system in the UK, because each trauma database is different and has a different context. So I think it's different to understand what we do and why we do it in each country without understanding the context of medical care and trauma within, within that country. So I thought I'd just give you a brief run through um, of uh, what TARN is and talk about the life cycle of data. Because in tra trauma data quality, we're really talking about the whole cycle from the birth of data to the death of data. Um, you may think that your data never dies, but I bet in 100 years time, nobody's gonna be looking at 2022 data or they may in, if they're, except in the history classes. So we're going to have a look at this life cycle of, of the data and how we can look at quality at each stage in that cycle. So to start off with 30 years of the Trauma Audit and Research Network um, in the UK, I think that's quite useful to look at because we've had a series of different stages in our data collection and the quality of our data collection. Um, TARN started more than 30 years ago when a group of um, emergency physicians who happened to be friends and trained together and worked in a group of hospitals in the centre of England decided that they should collect some data about head injury outcomes. So they each collected a bit of data in their own hospital. They had an Excel spreadsheet and a steam driven computer where they had to wind the handle at the back to do any analysis. Um, and um, they collected some data which informed some local meetings where they talked about um, the trauma treatment system and how they might improve the treatment system for head injury. So they made a number of changes in the system just from that really um, original data. But they realized that they needed to do some case mix adjustment because different hospitals were seeing different case mixes. This was a few years after the US MTOS, the major trauma outcome study had started. So two of the physicians from the UK went to America and did the uh, AAM training in AIS scoring. So then they brought that back taught the rest of the group how to do that. So the clinicians were doing AIS scoring, still entering into a spreadsheet. Um, one of the nurses was actually quite good at um, uh, uh, computer programming. So he made a little access database. So the system moved from an Excel spreadsheet to a small access database. We then had a change from instead of doing the scoring locally to local injury descriptions being sent for central AIS scoring. And we'll talk a little bit more about why that happened and how that happened. We then moved from having lots of pieces of paper being posted to having an online data entry system and a proper database rather than access. And then we had a sort of political phase where the trauma registry really became involved with the politicians and the medical politicians who are in charge of both um, safety within the community and um, management within medicine. Uh, it's really interesting hearing the talks from uh, both Saberara and from Marcus that it was some of that political involvement that has made change in the law or change in the medical treatment system. We then had um, payments to hospitals in the UK depended on scoring well in the trauma audit and providing good quality care. We then went to a business informatics info interface to replace the paper reports that we sent to hospitals. 
And I was very jealous listening to the integration of data systems and the links with the electronic health records that um, you have in Singapore, because that's just where we're, we're moving and where we're struggling at the moment. And also the comments, I, I think, from Japan about real time and the importance of real time reporting rather than trauma audit being this sort of retrospective thing that happens several, several months later. So that's just an outline of um, where we are in the UK. The medical politics has been really important for us and I think has been the reason why we could move from one stage to the other. Um, you were talking about, I think, was it 12 years of struggling with reports and not making any change in Malaysia? Well, it took 20 years of reports from the trauma service before we actually got uh, the real political engagement and cha cha change in, in the UK. I, wanted to put this slide in to point out that a lot of that change and a lot of that engagement came with the early data. We didn't need the very sophisticated data collection system that we've got now in order to make real change within, within the system. That success is really, I think, absolutely key. Um, this is a picture of a guy called uh, Professor Sir Keith Willett at the moment. Um, Keith is an orthopaedic surgeon. Um, I don't know if there are any orthopaedic surgeons in the room, but we're often really quite rude about orthopaedic surgeons and how they just hit things with big hammers. Um, but um, Keith is a very unusual orthopaedic surgeon in that he really, really understands systems in healthcare. He, um, he is you know, extremely intelligent, also very patient focused and really uh, understands how, what a system feels like to move through for the patient. Um, but, you know, as he said, he couldn't have made any of the changes that he made to the UK trauma system without having some data to back it up. And data has been absolutely key to the things that Keith, when he got into a political position, was able to do. Um, and we also made powerful links with public health doctors. Um, uh, I think, again, Marcus was talking with all the different specialities, all the different expertise that you can draw into your trauma data set. But I think thinking about trauma as a public health problem, um, rather than just as how to fix a bone or how to stop bleeding, has been a, a, a real advantage for us. And becoming part of the usual system that hospitals use to say, hey, we're doing good, and doing good is associated with having income has, has also been really key. So that's a sketch of the background to what I wanted to talk to you about, which is our data collection and our data quality system. So I think we had stage one of the data, of the data system, which was the clinicians collecting the data. Simple start, simple Excel spreadsheet, identification of cases to talk about at regional meetings, which was a benefit for the system and good education for the juniors. Um, I was actually one of the junior doctors that was doing the filling in uh, of, of this 30, 30 years ago. Um, and so it was really good education for us. And it also made the senior clinicians start thinking about how patients transferred between hospitals and how patients transferred through the system. So we made a lot of change within the, uh, in the central part of England, just on collecting data with a pen and pencil and, and, and an Excel spreadsheet. The next stage was really getting um, a, a wider involvement and becoming a, an expert and having a scoring system that came in. So the AIS score, which you are all gonna be very familiar with, was very new to us in those days. Um, this is um, <clears throat> the professor of emergency medicine in Manchester, David Yates. Um, who was really key to leading the uh, TARN audit system through this phase of um, becoming expert. We also got more of the trainees involved and then started getting the trainees um, doing some of the scoring, uh, but also producing papers for conf conferences. Uh, nurses became quite involved at this stage as part of their professional, professional development. So this was a stage where doing, the person doing the data collection varied between hospital. It depended on finding a local enthusiast. 
Um, there wasn't much of a data quality system, um, but we were still getting educational, organizational and clinical benefits from collecting registry data. We then had what I've called here stage three, which was when it was realized that clinicians are probably not the best data collectors. Having the consultants and the senior doctors and even the junior doctors collecting the data were quite an expensive resource for the health service. Um, we're time pressured, we don't really have much time for doing this. And doctors in particular overinterpret the notes. They say, well, it must have been this. And they use their clinical judgment to um, uh, overinterpret the notes, which then affects the, the scoring system. And we found that particularly with the more junior doctors, we just get them trained up to a level where they could do the scoring and then they'd move hospitals and rotate away. So we had to start again with someone who didn't know how, how to do the scoring. Now in the UK at this time, we started to have clerical staff who were employed as um, audit coordinators, audit clerks. This was because there were a number of scandals in the UK in the press around poor quality care in some units where it had sort of been hidden and hidden for many years. So the cardiac surgery for babies in Bristol was a real moment of change for the UK Health Service when it was realised that there were very poor outcomes in one particular unit in the UK that everybody in the profession knew that that wasn't a good unit and it wasn't a good, if you had a child that needed heart surgery you probably wouldn't send them there but actually nothing had been, nothing had been done about it. So clinical audit and clinical quality became, became a really big topic for our health services. So this gave us the opportunity to have administrative people who could be doing the data collection rather than clinicians doing the data collection. So the administrative, um, the uh, audit facilitators, the audit coordinators, they're not as expensive as doctors. They are not so time pressured because their whole job was to collect data for clinical audit. They didn't overinterpret the notes because they didn't have the clinical knowledge to overinterpret the notes. They just took what the facts that were there and they were permanent so they could be trained and uh, they, they, they would stay, stay in the same place. So this happened in about the mid 1990s. In some places, clinicians still did the trauma scoring because some clinicians really liked this and wanted to hold on to it. In other places, there was a move towards the, uh, the, the audit coordinators taking information about a description of the injuries and sending that description to the central trauma registry where skilled coders would do the coding. The reason that we didn't have AIS scoring being done in each hospital was difficulty in maintaining training and quality. You can train someone to extract the language and the words much more easily than you can train them to do the, the scoring. So the language and the words was extracted in each hospital. And then we had four or five people in the central registry who looked at all those injury descriptions and then added a added a code to them. So this really became stage four, which is professional data collection, which I think is probably where we are now. This is um, Marilyn Woodford, who was the uh, uh, chief executive and lead of the TARN system for many years. Um, she was a biomedical scientist by training, um, but spent uh, 20, more than 20 years leading the TARN system with a particular focus on the data collection and data quality. So this becomes the current system where each hospital has a part-time trained um, data collector they identify the cases and from the hospital notes and records, take out the injury description. There's a central training system for these uh, ind individuals, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. And then all that scoring, all the scoring is done in the center. We've now got five or six injury coders who do all the injury coding for the, for the whole country. 
we've got a quality assurance system for the central scoring and a quality assurance system for the registry data against separate national hospital activity statistics. So just to explain those two systems a little bit, we focus on two things in the, in, in the data quality system here. One is case ascertainment, the other is data completeness. Um, we sometimes call that data accreditation, which is a bit confusing if you speak English and is probably very confusing if you don't speak English. But when we talk about data accreditation, it's really the data completeness and accuracy. So the case ascertainment is what proportion of all of the trauma cases that occur are submitted to the registry. Um, and we used to have very variable case ascertainment. Some hospitals may be sending us 20% of their cases. We'll talk about missing data a little bit um, later on, but it's the 20% was probably not a representative 20% of that hospital's performance. So now because we're in the financial system and hospitals don't get paid for their patients unless they send in data, all are more than 90, 95%, many up at 98 or more. We know the true level of activity because there are national hospital statistics that code all patients with injuries. So we know the numbers of patients with injuries that are staying in hospital for more than three days because they have injury and length of stay. So for each hospital in the country, we know how many patients they should be sending into the registry. So we can reasonably easily calculate the percent, whether they're sending us all of the cases that they should be. There's also local activity statistics within the UK Health Service that we can, uh, that, that we can compare with. So that's case ascertainment. That's relatively easy to do automatically. This data is there and data is published. The data completeness and accuracy is more difficult to do, which is does the data in the registry actually reflect what is in the patient's notes? Um, so we do this in two ways. One is looking at completion rates, and we have within the registry a set of core fields, which are the fields that everybody should be completing for every patient. There's then a whole lot of other fields that um, you can complete if you want to. Particular hospitals want to look at particular things, particularly specialist groups want to look at particular things about their, their, their patients. So we look at the completion rates of the core fields, missing data, we can easily measure that. And then there's the accuracy of completion, which is more difficult to measure. Within the center, we have a route, we have a, where the AIS coding is done, we have a certain proportion, which is about 5%, which is recoded by a second coder without referring to the first, and then we can look at whether there's discrepancies between the two. That, again, because it all happens in the central um, uh, trauma registry, is reasonably easy for us to do. We then sometimes do audits of hospitals to look at whether the words in the notes are the same as the words the injury descriptors that are sent in for us to be coded. Now that's a lot more difficult because it means going to a hospital, it means finding that set of notes, it means someone independent looking through that set of notes. So we don't do very much of that. Um, if we think there's a problem, we might ask a hospital if we can come in and do that. Or if a hospital thinks that it has a problem with its data extraction, it might ask us to come in and do that double, double check, but we don't routinely do that on a, uh, on a national basis. So now we think that both case ascertainment and data quality are really important. And I think if you're looking at any publication from a trauma registry, if you don't know what their case ascertainment and data quality are, 
it's actually really difficult to interpret that publicational report. So we try and have in every one of the reports that we do, something about the data quality that goes into making up that report. Because we know that we have less than 100% data quality. Um, and in order for someone to understand that report, they've got to know about the quality of the data that has gone into it. So these are just different uh, illustrations of different ways that we, um, that we report on that data quality. And sometimes we refuse to do a report if the data quality isn't good enough. For example, if a hospital submits less than 80% of their cases, their line is just a blank. And instead of um, a WS statistic for that hospital, we used to put um, insufficient or data quality insufficient for uh, analysis. Um, and then we used to feed that back to the chief executive of the hospital. And actually that then often resulted in some funding going in to help uh, improve the data quality because hospitals don't like being the only one in the pack that says data quality insufficient for analysis. Um, as part of the quality, we do uh, also do a series of training courses. Um, there's a QR code which I think has come out in your brochure if you want to look through to the content of that. And we've also got a series of videos, again with a QR code, if you want to have a look, they're freely available online. They do sort of, they're, they're, they're a bit specific to the UK system, but there may be something in them that, that, that might be useful. Um, and we've done a bit of adapting of our training. We, we're just um, setting up some training for colleagues in Pakistan that are setting up a, a, a trauma registry to, uh, to, 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 help, to help them. The other part um, that I'd li like to talk about quality is data definitions. Um, we have, uh, we call it the clinical audit committee, but it's the, again, a group within the trauma registry that's in charge of quality and having um, a set definition for each of your data fields and having a agreed way that as trauma evolves, as new things become uh, important, like the difference between high energy transfer major trauma and low energy transfer major trauma, those definitions may evolve, but there needs to be a system where those definitions evolve in an agreed way rather than, um, uh, rather than just an ad hoc response of different, uh, diff different clinicians. Um, we were heavily involved and I chaired the Utstein meeting um, a number of years ago now that was the sort of international and European process to try and get an agreed core set of uh, data definitions. Um, I think that the Utstein core is a little bit, I think it's getting a little bit white and grey and probably hobbling around um, and need, needs an update. But I think having this uh, concept of having an internationally defined set of um, uh, definitions for some of our core fields that we can all agree on um, allows that in, in, in international comparison. And I think that's due for a, due, due for a refresh. Um, the WHO process goes some way towards that, but I don't think perhaps does it completely. I know we're running a little bit late, but I was going to talk about dark data about whether you have dark data around in your trauma system. This is missing data. I don't know if you come across this book by David Hand. Um, it's a very scary read for anyone that's involved in health service data. Um, it, uh, missing data can very easily give bias. And uh, what David Hand talks about is 15 different ways in which your data can be missing. Uh, and you know he's, his quote is, what you don't know matters. We all think that what we know matters, but actually what you don't know is um, really important as well because that causes bias. And when we're making change to the system, dependent on our registry's analysis, well, actually, if there's bias in that analysis and we're changing what happens to patients, that might well cause harm to patients instead of the good that we're trying to do to them. So what you don't know really matters. Um, 
my own conclusion is, you know, a small amount of good data is probably much better than a large amount of bad data. So people are often very proud of the number of patients that they have in their registry. And I'm sitting there thinking, hmm, wonder what your case ascertainment is, because that's, really, that's what really matters. So um, it, interestingly, in this book on dark data, um, this is um, a guy called Jenny Merckx, who's um, he's an AI um, mathematician um, who's uh, taught me lots about missing data and, da and, and dark data. He's done an analysis of our trauma um, data and, look, and shown some of the patterns of missingness that are present within that data. Um, and you know the way in which data is missing and the pattern of missingness really matters. Data that's missing completely at random is just you know some random thing that's just taken one um, bit of data out. So a blood pressure machine breaks down. You know, that's pure chance. That's missing at random. Um, there's also missing data that's then missing at random. So from the blood pressure data set itself, there's just some missing. If you look at the blood pressures, it's not related to the degree of blood pressure. It looks as if it's random, but actually it's the patients that have two broken arms. And if you've got two broken arms, you can't measure a blood pressure. And then there's a third type of missing data, which is called missing not at random, where the missing missingness depends on the value of the data itself. So for example, if the blood pressure is really low, the whole trauma team goes into overdrive, all the nurses are busy, all the doctors are busy, and no one writes the blood pressure down. So that's missing not at random because it's missing because of the value of the thing that's missing. So patterns of missingness matter. And the trouble is there's no test that tells you that pattern. That's a problem. There's no test that tells you if you've got missing data that's biasing your results. And what Evgeny has taught me is that the process that he goes through of looking at the data and assessing the data, looking at relationships between different variables, looking at distribution of values, looking at outliers, all of these things may give you clues that there is missing data in, in, your, in your data set. And this was a really interesting process because before I'd gone extracted a data set and done the analysis on it. And he was telling me, no, 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 this is absolutely wrong. There's a data understanding should come between those two processes. So this is really the stage between data engineering and data analysis. And I think this is often missed out. If you go and talk to experts in data analysis, they will tell you, yeah, of course. But I think most of us working with healthcare data sets, maybe it was just me that didn't really understand the importance of this, but I think a, a, a lot of people working with healthcare data sets take the data at face value and then say, this is what the data tells you. Whereas the, the phase of understanding the data helps you present the limitations in your conclusions from the, from, from the data set and put that in context. Within this links, I think, to imputation of missing values. Within the TARN system, our most frequently missing value is pre-hospital GCS. And in a lot of our um, analysis, we impute um, pre-hospital GCS um, or else, you know, you can, can you, you, you can't just discard those patients from the analysis. You need to, to have some way of, um, so imputation, if there's missing data, is often done, but it really needs to be used with caution. I thought that this was great because this was the solution to all of the blanks in our, in, in our data set. But this is good for data that's missing completely at random, but it's not necessarily good 
if it's data missing at random or missing not at random, because it might well create nonsense. Uh, There's just a schematic there of how um, multiple, multiple imputation actually, uh, actually works. So creating nonsense data by imputation. Um, let's have a look at an example here. I was trying to do some prediction based on our trauma data set, um, and I knew that pregnant trauma patients had different physiology and different response. So I wanted to use pregnancy test as one of the input variables to the model. I found that 50% of our patients had that missing data. So I thought, ah, I know about multiple imputation. I can impute those missing values from the values from the other 50% of the patients. And Statistically, mathematically, that is entirely possible. But of course, what I'm doing is imputing the pregnancy test results in men. So although I get results, positive or negative, and I can fill in all of those data fields with either positive or negative results of the pregnancy test in men, is that that's actually adding nonsense into the database. Now. I could see three or four people in the audience smiling when I put the first line because you have data understanding. You understand that data, but actually, if you give that data set to a mathematician, they won't have that data understanding and they may go ahead. So this is where working between the clinician and the analyst to have a data understanding is really, really important. Um, so, high quality data, um, I think our, our experience with TARN is that you don't have to have a really sophisticated data system to be a high quality system. Um, in particular, collecting small amounts of high quality data I think we've had more effect with than trying to collect a big national data set and only getting 60% 60, 60 of it. Um, quite a lot in the early days of TARN of our really good um, outcomes were when we decided within perhaps a region that we were going to really concentrate on two months worth of trauma data and get really good, complete, accurate data for two months rather than trying to do, okay, let's look, look at a two-year data set trying to do a, um, a, a bigger project. Um, we think that the training courses are really important. If you look at the feedback from the trauma audit facilitators, our trauma audit clerks or coordinators often work over several different subject areas. So they're collecting, they're also collecting data for cardiology. They're also collecting data for orthopedic outcomes and, and so forth. And one of the bits of feedback they always give is, why can't other specialities do this sort of course? Because we now really understand what it is that we, that we do and we understand why what we do is important and we understand the, the, the output to that. I think we learned that key aspects of quality, case ascertainment and the data accuracy are really important to put in all of our outputs so that we don't give, for example, a researcher that comes to us and wants a data set, we give them the data set. We also try and give them a measure of the quality of data that's in the data set that we, that, that, that we need. We think that missingness and missing data is one of our newer newer realizations. Perhaps we're a bit slow to get that realization, but I think the impact of missing data is often neglected. Um, and a data understanding, working with analysts and clinicians together um, is really, really important with that. And we need to think of that phase of data understanding. So we started to think across this life cycle of data. Um, and I'm not sure that we get this life cycle perfect, but this is the life cycle of data that's used by NHS Digital, which is the uh, overall organization within the health service in the UK that's in, 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 in charge of data and everything to, to do with it. Um, so there is 
stuff around the creation of the data. So we are working with various um, royal colleges because the way that clinicians write things down in the notes actually affects the way and the accuracy with which we can score. So for example, we're working with the College of Surgeons to say, okay, in the operative notes, could you please, the length of the laceration or the amount of bleeding is actually important. Can we have that as a standard? And as we move towards electronic um, operation notes and electronic CT reporting, we can build some of these things into the electronic systems that are coming com com through. Um, Organising the data, we've got that in a, um, uh, in, in a uh, commercial database and we've got now two people that are involved in getting that organised. Um, sharing and having high quality um, systems for extracting data and sharing them. Thinking about how we keep the data, where we keep the data, what organisation controls the data um, and what the rules are around that. How we perhaps update that data because we're looking for perhaps, you know, if a patient, we do a one year follow up and they're alive. Well, if we do a 50 year follow up, they're probably not going to still be alive. How do we get the data updated as, as time goes by? And then what happens at the end of the life cycle of data? We probably want to keep our data for quite a long time, but there will be an end of a life cycle. And how, how, is, how is that then handled? So um, I thought I'd leave you with a picture of the UK at the moment. We're in a 50 year, worst, the worst drought for 50 years. This is just outside my house. That it should be a green and pleasant land in England. It's a brown land and you can see that the leaves on the trees have turned brown and are fall, falling off. That doesn't happen for another two and a half, three months usually. I'm quite happy to take any questions. I'm also happy to move on to the discussion so that we can have the questions as part of the discussion. Thank you. Okay. Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Jung Ju, uh, working in South Korea. I am announcing this meeting. Okay. Uh, how was your night? <laughs> Did you spend a good night? Yeah. <laughs> Some of you go to went went to the second round <laughs> to chicken and beer. Yeah, it was a very good night. So we are going to the second day of uh, Patos ACE Research Workshop. Okay, welcome to the, this meeting. So we have three sessions today. Uh, session three is special lecture, and session four is trauma uh, education and training, and session five is uh, Patos Open Meeting. So the set, this, uh, for, uh, uh, today's, today's first session is special lecture. Uh, Dr. Gyeong Jun Song uh, will be uh, moderator of this uh, session. Uh, he is, uh, Dr. Gyeong Jun Song is uh, one of the uh, Asian EMS leader and uh, he is a chair, uh, the chair of Korean Association of EMS Physicians and he is also working in uh, Seoul National University Borame Hospital in South Korea and he is also co-chair of Trauma System Monitoring Committee of uh, Patos. Uh, Dr. Song, please. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, have you enjoyed workshop and Seoul, Korea? Till now? Okay, great. Uh, it's, it's nice, good to see you again in Seoul. So we expected this meeting uh, too much. So, yeah. Uh, today we will talk about uh, some uh, trauma education and uh, uh, trauma training program in each country. So, uh, first speaker, I want to invite Dr. Uh, Kevin Edwin Mackey from US. Uh, he uh, has been a part of the uh, EMS profession for uh, over 20 years, uh, first as a provider and currently as a regional medical director and, and uh, also fire service medical director for the uh, second largest ambulance uh, provider in California, uh, Sacramento Regional Fire Service, 
uh, in Sacramento, California. And uh, he uh, fulfilled his affiliated residency in emergency medicine from uh, University Health Science Center, University of Pittsburgh. And uh, uh, recently, he promoted to a chairman for the National Registry of EMT, NREMT in US. Uh, I have a lot of things to tell you about Kevin because Kevin and I uh, been some friendship uh, very long time, but I should stop for his great lecture. Uh, please welcome Dr. Uh, Kevin E. Mackey. Mask off is okay, KJ? Okay. okay. I'll just make it easier. Good morning. Thank you for the honor to come and speak with you. Thank you to Dr. Shin, Dr. Song, for your kind invitation. Um, I hope to, to share with you some things from the United States about trauma training uh, and also to have a little bit of fun um, for you to leave here with maybe some new ideas uh, maybe some suggestions. Uh, and I'm definitely, as I said earlier, I learn more when I come here than, than I think I teach. So I'm looking forward to learning from you as well. So uh, I'm going to speak to you today from a few different roles that I, that I do as a fire service director that does a lot of the trauma training with our paramedics. Uh, also as a uh, EMS physician, that evaluates trauma that's brought in by our paramedics. And then my role is the chair of the National Registry, also, which is the certification body for all of the paramedics in the United States. So we're gonna start out. I'm a big Star Wars fan. Does anyone know who this one is? Right. Yes, Han Solo, right, exactly. So Han Solo is going to be our our our, our paramedic student today, and and the, and the and the goal is is to is to train Han Solo in trauma training, to become much like a warrior, and so Han Solo is going to fiercely run in and he's going to take care of this trauma. Does anyone remember the name of the of the vessel that Han Solo used to fly? What he pilots? The Millennium Falcon, exactly. So. When Han Solo has finished his training and he's ready to jump in with trauma, he's going to learn how to pilot the, the Millennium Falcon. There is going to be a theme here, so it's not all about Legos and toys. There actually is a theme here going forward. Okay, so what is the primary goal of trauma care in EMS? What, what, what do we look for? So from a U.S.-based model, I think this is pretty consistent worldwide, is you look for the standard of care. So there has to be a uniform standard of care just to start from. You have to know what you're trying to train and the goal of your training to begin with. And we base this on nationally established educational and training guidelines. So these, uh, I'm gonna lay out a framework for you today to, 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 to hopefully help you understand how we get Han Solo to flying that Millennium Falcon. So, we're involved in a car accident. We need help. And we need to make sure that the help that we get is competent and understands how to deliver trauma care. So we get some men and women that arrive. This is actually Kasumnas Fire Department. This is one of the fire departments I'm medical director for. And that, that young woman in front is Julie Ryder. She's a captain with the fire department. But you have four providers there that have all come from four very different backgrounds, maybe from four different parts of the United States. How do we know that each of the four of them are trained to a standard of trauma care that is acceptable to you and I, who are the person who's injured? We want to make sure we get good, competent care. And so we don't know who these people are. We don't know where they came from. We don't know the kind of trauma training they had. And that's the reason that we need to have a national standard, a floor, a baseline to start from. And that same standard has to apply if you and I are out on a rural road, way out in the middle of nowhere, and we get in that same car accident. It has to apply if you're in downtown Sacramento. That's our main street in downtown Sacramento. That's the capital of Sacramento. Um, right there in the background. So no matter where this trauma happens, it has to be consistent. 
So EMS in the United States is built on five pillars. This is the floor that I want to try to walk you through today. The EMS ed education agenda for the future was written in 1996. It was written as a national document and is written by stakeholders from all areas of EMS, national leaders, state leaders, educators, providers and paramedics, physicians, came together and they wrote this EMS Education Agenda for the Future that provides the foundation for the five pillars that sit on top of it. Those are the five pillars right there. Reading from left to right, it's core content, scope of practice, education standards, certification and accreditation. Pretty much in order, that's the way that they go from left to right. But we are gonna talk about just three of them in this talk, we're gonna talk about the core content, the scope of practice, and the education standards. The birthplace of EMS core content came out of a 2001 document in, in one of our large uh, emergency medicine journals, which was the model of clinical practice of emergency medicine. It came out of the Annals of Emergency Medicine in 2001. This was the depth, the breadth, the scope of emergency medicine in our country. This document kind of talks about what the core content is. If you think about, if you think about a four lane highway, right? This is the entire highway. This is what everything can operate on. And it's out of this document that we drew the EMS core content, which is this document. So this document was developed in about 2001. Uh, actually, 2007 is where the EMS core content came in. And in 2007, and it was refreshed again just a few years ago, where we, this is the, this is everything that a paramedic needs to know to practice. So this is all of the knowledge, all of the conditions that needs to happen that you need, a paramedic needs to learn. So now we know where everything is going to come from. But who's going to do those things? So in 2009, and then again, a refresh in 2019, we have this national EMS scope of practice. So in the United States, there are four levels of providers. There's EMRs, responders. So this takes about 20 to 40 to 50 hours of training. The next is EMT. EMT is, is the next step up, and that takes you know a couple hundred hours. AEMT is advanced EMT, which is just below a paramedic. They can start to do some of the advanced skills like starting IVs and giving some medications. And then the top step is paramedic. For this course, we're going to focus a lot on paramedics, but I wanted to let you guys know that the national EMS scope of practice takes that whole highway and it divides it up into lanes. You can drive in this lane if you're an EMR. You can drive in that lane if you're an EMT. This is what legally you can do based upon your training level in the United States. So that's the scope of practice. And here it was refreshed in 2019. And when we refreshed this document, we got many educators, same model, national leaders, state leaders, educators, physicians came together and we decided upon what the scope of practice for each of these four levels would be. And then come the education standards. Now we know what they need to know, and we know what each level needs to know for their level. How do you train them? Like, where does the education come in? What are the key parts of their education? So this document that uh, came that was refreshed in 2021 is our education standards. We're in the third pillar now. These are the education standards. We know what they need to know. We know what they need to know for their level, and we now need to, now we know how to train them. So in the education standards, you're going to find, and I'm not going to get too much into this, but every single page of the education standards looks like this. At the very top, you see the four levels across the top, EMR, EMT, AMT, and paramedic. It basically says the same things, but as you get into the pages of the education standards, these start to look very different. But at the very top, you can see that yellow area is competency. This is extremely important, extremely important. Each person that arrives at the scene of an accident has to be minimally competent. They have to have a minimum level of competency. And this first level establishes what that competency is. The blue level just below it says additional things within that competency that they need to know. And I'm going to get into further. This will become a little bit more clear later as I start to show you some of these competencies. 
clinical behaviors and judgments that go along with those competencies, and then education infrastructure. What are the key parts of the education that you need for each and every specific part of the trauma training? The education standards represent the floor. This is the bottom. Every single person graduating from a paramedic program has got to be at least at this level, period. And our national exam, which I'm the chair of the board for, it's called the National Registry of EMTs. Every person who graduates from a paramedic program is required to sit for our examination. It's our national examination. All states require it in the United States. And it establishes that that paramedic has met a minimum entry level competence. So as you graduate your program and you take the exam, as you pass the exam, you become licensed in your state that you're working in and you have a minimum level competency. You've met the floor, okay? But it's also a building block process. We know that paramedics continue to grow, right? They continue to add more knowledge. They continue to add more specialties and things like that. So you can build on this, but the education standards represent the floor. And this this shows that that as you go in breadth, which is the all the knowledge and in depth, the depth of the knowledge, how much you need to know about each topic. The paramedic level encases everything in the AMT level. The EMT level encases everything in the EMT level and likewise EMT encases everything in the EMR level. So paramedics have knowledge of all of these levels. They have knowledge of the entire depth and breadth of everything outside that happens in the uh, pre-hospital world. So here's for trauma. This is the education standards for trauma. As you go from left to right, it talks about increasing integrated knowledges of pathophysiology and the management. It talks about cardiac arrest and peri arrest states here, but it talks about a paramedic needs to have all of the pathophysiology, anatomy, and all the care and treatment for each and every one of the conditions in trauma. So what are those? These are the categories in the education standards under trauma. So each and every one of these has, whoops, sorry, I went backwards. We'll go back. Second one. Up. Second one. Second one? Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna go back one more. So each of those has this underneath it. So think of this with each of those categories. Each of those categories has got minimum competencies and minimum education levels and infrastructure for each of these conditions, a trauma overview, abdomen, bleeding, chest trauma, nervous trauma, multi-system trauma, head, facial, neck, and spine trauma, environmental emergencies, orthopedic trauma, soft tissue trauma, and then special considerations like pregnancy would be a special consideration for trauma. So these are the trauma categories in the education standards. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples. Pulling out of those education standards for a paramedic level as an instructor, as a person who, who makes laws for states, I draw from this document to say that all of my paramedics have to know the anatomy, physiology, pathophysiology, diagnosis, and treatment of all of these conditions just for chest trauma just for chest trauma. So this gives you an example of, of, of what an educator would need to teach to. Penetrating and blunt mechanisms, open chest wounds, impaled objects, hemothorax, all the way down to blunt cardiac injury, tracheal bronchial disruption, and diaphragmatic tear. You can see how this becomes very deep, very quick. There's a lot of education. This is one of those prior 15 categories I showed you, just one of them. Let's take a look at another one. There's abdominal and genital urinary, blunt versus penetrating mechanisms, evisceration, impaled objects, vascular injuries, retroperitoneal injuries. So each and every single one of these categories comes with a list of what is required. Again, this is a national document. This is a national floor. This is the bottom. Everybody has to know this stuff. Okay, so Han, He's got the tools. He thinks he knows how to fly this thing, all right? But not so fast, right? He's finished his paramedic training. 
He's gone through, he's, he's met the education standards. He has the minimum level competency in all of those 15 categories. He's taken a national test and he is certified as minimally competent. So we've taken the national EMS core content, the scope of practice, and we have the building blocks to build the Millennium Falcon. We can build Han into this great trauma warrior. But then comes the states. So Han chooses to work in California, my state. This is insignia for the California State EMS Authority. All right. The states come in and they set the laws. They set the rules and the guidelines for the paramedics. They can't be less restrictive than the national guidelines, but they can be more restrictive. They can put on more requirements as far as what training is required for paramedics. And so in my state, through regulation, we do have, this is a, I just this is a snapshot right off the page in our state regulations. You look down here, program requirements for paramedic training programs. So under this area right here, it's going to highlight what is needed for a paramedic program to train. And under this, under the Article 3, it has required course content. This is where I can go in my state to identify what is required for my paramedics to learn to work and operate on the streets in California. That may be different, by the way, state to state, not that much, but it might be different. So our state programs train to this regulation body and they have the blueprint to build the Millennium Falcon. So the states, take from this national core content, the scope of practice and the education standards, and they form the blueprint for what our paramedic training programs need to teach trauma in our schools. They've taken all these building blocks, all those 15 categories, all that list of everything that they need to know, and they build this blueprint. And so when a paramedic attends Sacramento State University paramedic school, or they attend NCTI, which I think I've got some of those. Here's some examples of just the local training institutions in and around Sacramento. If they attend one of these, UCLA is down in Southern California. No matter where you go, if you go into, if you go into other parts of the state, Sierra College, you will get the same standard for paramedic training. So our schools start to build the Millennium Falcon and they train our paramedics in various forms of trauma. In the United States model, we use two large programs, PHTLS and ITLS, and it's really dependent. It's not really prescribed. You can choose one or the other, and a lot of our state requirements have all of the trauma training inside one of these two programs. I'm gonna show you how they're, how they're similar and how they're different. Both programs have 16 hours of training. They're designed for all, for all levels, and they have a skill and a didactic session. And here's some of the topics they have in common. They talk about scene management, patient assessment, airway management, shock, all the various forms of head, spinal, thoracic, abdominal, musculoskeletal trauma, burns, pediatric, and geriatric trauma. Those are the things they have in common. Both of these national programs teach these in common. But PHTLS is a little bit different. It's sponsored by one of our national organizations called National Association of EMTs. It's a voluntary organization you can belong to. It's got probably about two or 3,000 members, mostly paramedics. And it provides an array of other courses. But in addition to those initial courses I talked to you about, it also teaches in disaster management, weapons and mass destruction, environmental trauma, wilderness trauma care, tactical EMS and injury prevention. So this is different from ITLS. If you took PHTLS, you would get that core, plus you would get all of this. So a school or a state or a county can choose to require PHTLS. My county requires PHTLS in Sacramento. If you go to Yolo County right next door, they can require ITLS. The two of them are so similar that it really doesn't really make a big difference between county to county. When you get those four paramedics that show up on scene, you know that all of them have got the same training, the same standard. ITLS is sponsored by the American College of Emergency Physicians. It's our large college. 
of the emergency physician. It also provides on a wide array of other courses and it emphasizes the importance of familiarity with new equipment and procedures. But this one uniquely allows customization to regional and local needs. So for example, we're gonna to get to this. We've talked about national standards. We've talked about state requirements. We're gonna to get to the local stuff in just a second. Some of the local things it require in Sacramento may be applicable to us, but if you go 30 to 40 miles south in San Joaquin or Modesto, you may not have those same requirements because they don't have the same kind of needs that we do. For example, farming. So let's talk about farming. In the Central Valley of California, there's a large rural, uh, I'm sorry, urban area where I live in Sacramento. South of there for about 200 miles is all farming. So if you get out in those areas, you may need specialized training in your schools about farming equipment, disasters, amputations, things like that, that we're never gonna see in Sacramento. So a local medical director could require their paramedics to get specialized training in farm equipment disasters, amputations, things like that. Let's take to the local requirements. So unfortunately, uh, in the United States, we have some shootings. We have some mass shootings. Uh, you've seen them uh, a lot on the news. Um, uh, we've got some examples here of Sandy Hook. The one in the top right corner is actually Sacramento. Uh, this was the K Street shooting that happened about um, three, four months ago. Um, four, four, four assailants came out of a nightclub at two o'clock in the morning and just started to shoot people at random. Um, so we have, unfortunately, need for, for various things. And so locally, um, our, my fire department, Sacramento Fire Department, is involved with our police department in something called intentional MCI. I'm going to show you a video of this in just a second. And what we do is, is our police department and fire department bought an abandoned school. So the school was abandoned. They were going to destroy it. We went to the county. We asked, can we buy that school? They said, sure. So they left the school completely standing. We stage school shootings and nightclub shootings in that school twice a month working side by side with our police department, which is pretty amazing because when you come to the K Street shooting, which you're gonna, which we'll talk about briefly, the K Street shooting, our first victim moved off the scene in six minutes. Our last victim moved off the scene in 18 minutes. And if you look at some of the document, some of the documents from prior wars, if you don't move the first victim within the 45, within 45 minutes, everybody's dead. 45 minutes and you're, and you're done, no matter where you're shot. Hemorrhaging from arteries peripherally, hemorrhaging internally. So we have a standard that every single patient is moved off the scene as fast as possible. And we coordinate this with our local police department. You're gonna see this in just a second. I think we have a video and hopefully. Leaders say that special hands-on training that they do every year with the Sacramento police prepared them to save lives in Sunday morning's shooting downtown. ABC 10's Becca Habiger visited one of the training sessions today and shows us why the department says without this training, more people could have died on Sunday. And we want to warn you, the drills that you're about to see in this story are intense and depict an active shooter scenario. Those victims are going to pile out quickly. The training you're about to see is entirely staged for teaching purposes. It happened at a former elementary school that has been closed for years, and a Sacramento Fire spokesperson said the department notifies neighbors, which is important to know because the training sounds and looks all too real. This is one of those things that we have to practice at in an uh, artificial environment over and over again so that we make sure we're effective at our objectives. Eric Sailors is assistant chief of the Sacramento Fire Department's EMS division and leads these mass casualty incident trainings Patient jointly movers. with Sacramento's fire and police departments, something they've been doing for five years now. Please, guys, help, help. Help's help, coming, help. help. We base all of our drills on real life events and our first drill we mimicked out the Charlottesville event, which was a vehicle into a crowd, and then we started looking at the Boston bombing marathon, and then the Pulse nightclub. This one is based on a school shooting. With 36 sessions like this happening in 2022, the goal was to train as many of Sacramento's firefighters and police officers as possible each year. The Sacramento Fire Department says education and training from drills like this absolutely saved lives in Sunday morning shooting. They did exactly what we trained them to do. They were on scene in two minutes. They engaged within the first five minutes. That's and they started transporting victims very quickly. If this had happened five years prior to this training happened, we would not have been as 
fast or as aggressive for getting the patients. And the seven people that they did transport would not have survived if the time was delayed at all. He says Sunday's incident is still too fresh to be bringing lessons learned into today's training, but they're in the process of looking at what worked and how they can improve their response. Now, the assistant fire chief says that next year's training will likely be modeled off Sunday's shooting downtown and could involve blocking off a city street. The department will be holding more of this year's drills at Clayton B. Wire Elementary School periodically through November. Thank you. Stomp the pain. So we, uh, we held one of those drills just six days ago. Um, and it's, it's very interesting because it's, it's a different dichotomy for how you look at a trauma patient when you go into an event like that. They're called victims, not patients. Okay, that's a very important thing. We're not doing a lot of assessment. The only treatment we do inside there is we make a decision alive or dead. So if, if they are, and this is gonna sound very, very, it, it won't sound right to some people. We carry, we carry nightsticks, we carry glow sticks, and if they are dead, we pop a glow stick and we put it in their mouth. So you can see in low light situations where the bodies are, and you can also count how many are dead just by just by a visual. We work, we work very closely with our police department, and what happens is is we show up uh, we show up in mass together. Officers go in and they 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 secure they secure the scene. We don't say clear the scene; they secure it wherever there is a firearm in a room. That, that room is secure. Doesn't matter if there's still shooting going on. If there's a firearm in that room, that room is secure. So what we do is we show up in teams, uh, fire department on one side, PD on the other side, we're at a common entry point. Officers go in and they secure the scene. Uh, two of them come out. One of them gets with the fire department, one of them gets with the police department. Police go in first and they create a corridor all the way in. They put an officer, as many as they can, in doorways facing away so we're looking for their back not for their barrels we teach if you're looking at an officer's barrel you're on the wrong side so you'd be looking at their back so we're at their back all the way down and we follow and they lead us all the to the victims and we do only one treatment there we apply a tourniquet that is it apply a tourniquet get them on one of these movers and we move them out and we move them out to a staging location where ambulances come in and we do something called ace ace abdominal chest extremity so we, we corridor them off into abdominal, chest, and extremity wounds. And as ambulances come in, they take, ab they take all the abdominals first, right? And then as the next, because we can put in chest seals. And so the paramedics on the outside that are, that are now assessing, and be, these victims are now becoming patients, they're getting chest seals if they have chest wounds, and they're getting wound packing if they need wound packing. And they're getting reapplication and tourniquets if they need that. So as ambulances file in, the abdominals leave first, the chest leave next, and extremities leave last, which makes you wonder, what about the ones with head wounds, right? Isolated head wounds, not chest, not extremity, not abdomen. Where do those go? Those go in the extremity because almost none of those are going to survive. And so we don't, we don't utilize resources early on in the process where we can use resources other places that are going to result in more lives saved. And so we do this We do this training over and over and over again. And when we showed up at the K Street shooting, it was very natural. We showed up, they showed up. And the, the, the interesting dichotomy that you have to get about law enforcement versus fire is law enforcement is built to de-escalate things. So they show up in mass and they de-escalate from the top down. They want to, they want to suppress the threat, stop the threat, and then they de-escalate. Fire department thinking is completely the opposite. It's all about escalation. We show up, a building's on fire. Oh, we're going to need more units. And so you order a second alarm, a third alarm assignment, and we escalate. So we had to understand that our thinking was coming at this from different angles. They escalate, we, they de-escalate, we escalate. So we had to meet in the middle and have a discussion about how we we're going to get in there. And it took them a long time to agree to allow us in the room while there's still active shooting potentially going on. We, we know that there's a threat and there's a risk there, but we also know they have our back because by the time we go in, there's multiple officers in there, multiple firearms, and we're less worried about the risk of, uh, of, being, of being hurt. All right, so let me wind this whole way back. So we started with national, we built a floor. 
The states then can come in behind and they can say, we want you to be a little bit more prescriptive about these things locally. If I live in a farming community, I'd like you to have more farming training in this area. And then even more local than that, we can come into Sacramento and say, we want to do intentional training with our police force because unfortunately, we have a lot of firearms, a lot of shooting incidents, and so that we can save more lives because we know we have 45 minutes from that first shot until no one survives. All right, so bringing a summary, uh, that's kind of what I just said. The states decide and determine what actually is required for trauma education for the paramedic. Education institutions then teach the student when, the, when what the state requires, and local jurisdictions can require merit badges or training of PHTLS and ITLS. And we can also offer specialized training like active shooter, stop the bleed, specialty rescue and extrication. And Han has made it and he knows how to fly. He's our pilot. Thank you very much. So we are going to the next session, uh, the session number four, uh, trauma education and training uh, in Asian countries. Uh, we are preparing the session uh, and please wait a second. So the chair of this session uh, will be Dr. Sabaria Jamaluddin and Dr. Uh, Jen Thompson. Okay, uh, Dr. Son uh, cannot come to South Korea, so he is maybe online. Uh, Dr. Son, could you hear my voice? Uh, okay, I, I, I will introduce uh, the chair of this session, uh, the first, first chair, Dr. Sabaria. Uh, Dr. Sabaria Zamaluddin is uh, working in the University Technology Mara in Malaysia. Uh, she is also a national PI of Malaysia Patos team and also a co-chair of the Patos, uh, Patos uh, Hospital Trauma uh, Monitoring Committee. And the uh, second chair is Dr. Zen Tangson. Uh, he is also a national PI of Taiwan Patos team, and he is working in the Far Eastern Memorial Hospital as an emergency physician. Okay, Dr. Sun, uh, can you speak with your microphone? No. Oh, okay, you hear okay. Me now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can hear you. Okay, hello. Okay, Dr. Sabarian, Dr. Sun, uh, you could, you can uh, uh, beginning this session, please. Uh, my colleague, Dr. Sun Jenteng from uh, Taiwan is there online. <laughs> he can't be with us today. Uh, we will chair the session four on trauma education and training, uh, the development and implementation for hospital or hospital provider in Asian countries. Uh, I'll present the first, first three speakers while Dr. Sun will uh, present the, the next three, three speakers. Uh, I would like to introduce you to you the first speaker. He is Dr. Subramadam Jagadesan, from, who is an emergency physician in India. Uh, Dr. Jagadesan has more than 10 years' experience in the emergency department and he obtained his MD in accident and emergency medicine from the Sri Ramachandra Medical College and Research, Research Insti Institute in uh, Chennai in uh, 2018 and he currently works as an associate professor and senior consultant at the same medical center. He's involved in many resuscitation courses and is instructor in ACLS among the other courses and with his vast experience in life support courses and training, uh, let us welcome Dr. Jagatesan who will present to us the trauma training education in India. Dr. Jagatesan is unable to be with us today and he will present his presentation online. Let us welcome Dr. Jagatisen. Hi, good day and good morning everyone. Uh, today we'll discuss a few points over trauma education and training program in India. India is a country which finds unity in diversity. There are 28 states, 8 union territories, 122 languages and 216 mother tongue. It is the seventh largest country and the second most populous. India alone in India alone, 1 million people die and 20 million hospitalized every year due to trauma. This is not only increases the morbidity and mortality rate, but also affects the national productivity on account of younger population being mainly involved in road traffic accidents. This mandates the importance of standardization of pre-hospital trauma care and establishing emergency medicine departments throughout India. 
So, post coming to postgraduate uh, education in <coughs> emergency medicine, emergency medicine was officially recognized by Medical Council of India in July 2009. First emergency medicine postgraduate training recognized by Medical Council of India commenced at BJ Medical College and NHL Hospital Gujarat in June 2010. <coughs> Presently, 58 medical colleges are offering 187 seats every year. The National Board of Examinations, which is an independent academic body in India, also recognized emergency medicine in July 2013 and the first trainees commenced from October 2014. Uh, currently, 76 hospitals are offering around 167 seats every year. The initial uh, stages of emergency medicine uh, postgraduates, uh, EMS technician, EMT, paramedic, uh, undergraduates are all trained by anesthesiologists, internal medicine, general sur surgeons. However, the acceptance of EM emergency medicine as a specialty by various departments and clinicians of the hospital took a long time. And uh, at this point of uh, time, the Medical Council of uh, India mandates all the medical college to have a fully functional emergency medicine department from March 2022. Emergency Medicine Residency Training Program happens in India in various bodies like Society of uh, Emergency Medicine in India, SEMI, and they conduct a Master's in Emergency Medicine, and George Washington University under them, there is also a Master's in Emergency Medicine. In Royal College of uh, Emergency Medicine, they conduct a MRCM program, and along with DNB and, and MD, MCA. So this is a overview of uh, various uh, emergency medicine postgraduate training programs uh, except the diploma in emergency medicine all are three years programs and they have various uh, recognized bodies. Uh, MD, uh, MD emergency medicine postgraduates undergoes uh, basic medical sciences in the first year uh, rotations like two months in every basic medical science subjects. In the second year, he will go for speciality and super speciality, and in the third year, he will go for pediatrics, cardiac ICU, and orthopedics. We are coming to uh, undergraduate uh, training. So it is uh, based on competency-based uh, curriculum. Uh, it's, uh, this picture shows the Bloom, Bloom's taxonomy of education uh, learning objectives into the level of complexity and specificity. Learning objects further divided into three domains like cognitive that is knowledge based, affective that is emotional based and psychomotor is action based. In that cognitive further divided into remember, understand, apply, analyze, evaluate and create. In this basis our uh, undergraduate programs are scheduled. And we conduct foundation course uh, where the undergraduate as soon as he he enters the medical school, he will have a foundation course in the first month uh, in the beginning of the medical course. So this helps the students to get sensitized and acclimatize the medical uh, new, new professional environment who directly comes from school, school education environment. Foundation course orient the learner for many basic uh, skills like basic life support and first aid trauma management and it also emphasizes do's and don'ts in the medical uh, trauma and environmental emergencies. These courses orient the learner in medical ethics, attitude and professionalism. It also orients the students in national health priorities and policies, universal precautions and vaccinations, patient safety and biohazard safety, interpersonal relationships, communication, stress management, use of information technology, first aid and basic life support. So there are a few uh, uh, pictures uh, on the modules what we teach to our undergraduate students in our institution. So it's a basic life support module is there, first aid module, universal precautions, biomedical waste and safety management. So in these modules, the students perform the basic life support in the skills lab. He also performs first aid in simulated environment and follow biosafety and universal precautions, demonstrate handling and safe disposal of biohazardous material in a simulated environment. So they demonstrate the proper hand washing and use of personal protective equipments, demonstrate appropriate response to needle stick injuries. So uh, this is a flow chart of how a basic life support module is taken to an undergraduate student. So usually there will be 
group of five students and around 15 groups will be there. So they have to introduce to the chest compression airway and breathing algorithm, recognizing cardiac arrest and respiratory arrest, effective chest compression, delivering effective breaths, use of automated external defibrillators, and it will be assessed and their competencies will be assessed if they need a remedial or a repeat. So this is another uh, module of first aid. Here they will again see the first aid basics, medical emergencies like any breathing problems, choking, allergic reactions, injury emergencies like controlling active bleeding, bandaging, burns injuries, electrical injuries, environmental emergencies. This also emphasizes the students on do's and do's in each category. The objective of the early clinical exposure is to recognize the relevance of basic sciences in diagnosis, patient care and treatment. It also provides the context that it will enhance basic science learning. Relate the experience of patients as a motivation to learn. It recognizes the attitude, ethics and professionalism as an integral to the doctor-patient relationships. So, in our department, the uh, student will come for the early clinical exposure for four weeks. In the first week, they will have a international pa patient safety goals, uh, pre-hospital triaging, medico-legal documentation, registration, decontamination and barrier room, uh, universal and standard precautions, disposal of personal protective equipments, shops and biomedical waste. In the second week, they will be uh, have hands-on training on basic life support, recognizing cardiac arrest, airway and breathing skills, CPR techniques, use of automated external defibrillators, and manage choking. And also, crash cart and common emergency drugs, and uh, advanced uh, airway equipments, use of defibrillator during cardiac arrest, ultrasound ventilators and blood gas, and rapid cardiac kit. So this is a crash cart is demonstrated by the faculty to the students. In the third week, they will have a, a skills like bedside teaching of how to order a ECG and how to do it and how to interpret it. And a blood gas, importance of reading a chest x-rays, IV cannulations, catheter and nasogastric tube insertion and trauma agents. In the fourth week, they will have common clinical cases, how it was managed and they will observe and they will assist the like common emergencies of acute coronary syndrome, acute stroke, any respiratory failure, trauma management, burns management, poisoning management and snake bite protocols. This will uh, give them theory knowledge and importance of common emergency medical condition, understand its managing protocol and clinical pathway. This is a competency assessment sheet. So there you will have the uh, which competency they are getting assessed like uh, maintenance of AIRV in mannequin. So which day they were assessed, whether their uh, skill is up to the expectation or below the expectation or exceed the expectation will be given by the faculties. If the student is not up to the level, they may have a remedial training program. There is another assessment sheet where they will order, perform and interpret an ECG. At the end of uh, uh, end of the MBBS and in the internship period, they must perform identifying any acute emergencies, managing acute anaphylactic shock, management of peripheral vascular failure and shock, acute pulmonary edema, drowning, poisoning, asthma and status asthmaticus, management of hyperpyrexia and management of comatose patients. There are many procedures they uh, can assist, they can observe and they can perform like venipuncture, intramuscular injection, intradermal injection, subcutaneous injections. They can uh, perform bladder catheterization, basic life support. They can actively participate in cardiopulmonary resuscitation, oxygen therapy, nebulization, Rhinus tube insertion, lumbar puncture. There are certain skills where they can observe and later on when they became confident they can perform in that lumbar puncture is they will initially observe once they are good they will go for they will perform the skill. Pleural and uh, acetic fluid aspiration also initially they will observe cardiac resuscitation. 
coming to ems education in emergency medical services education we conduct under undergraduate trauma care management four year program and a post graduate two year program as also a, a diploma in aviation medicine it's a one year program which is uh, conducted by icat it is international critical care air uh, transfer team provide air ambulance services in variety of medical transfer and early trauma emergency response the undergraduate uh, curriculum is based on choice based credit system it provides equal weightage to theory and clinical skills it improves the competency of the student provides specific learning outcomes and basic skill enhancement it has uh, three main divisions like core subjects elective subjects and enhancement subjects core subjects will be the same elective subjects again subdivided into two one one is discipline specific elective like pathology basic computing generic elective which will be chosen by the students enhancement subjects like language and skill en enhancement so this is a semester assessment sheet under the choice based credit system with credit hours for the each subject the credit hours is ca calculated like if he has to attend 15 hours to get one credit in theory paper and he has to attend 30 hours to get one credit hours in lab and practicals new updates on emt so ministry of skill development and entrepreneurship provides emt basic and advanced health sector skill courses under national skill development corporation it's a six months program our university is a approved member of health care sector skills council so we provide the certification under nsdc national skills development corporation nsdc has 538 training partners it has more than 10000 training centers it has uh, trained more than 20 lakh people and uh, there is more than 1.1.85 uh, lakh people are placed so for a emt basic they should spend at least 100 hours in theory duration and uh, in practical around 260 hours employability and entrepreneurship hours around 40 so emt basic should uh, total hours of 400 to get a emt basic certification the same case in case of advanced they have to spend around 1200 hours so the main learning object will be uh, principles of physiology pathophysiology anatomy and therapeutic communications management and assessment of patients advanced airway management advanced patient assessment advanced trauma and medical interventions advanced pharmacology is a model of certification which is issued by nsdc so sri ramchandra institute of higher education and research has a tie up with the nsdc and this is two batches from our university students in 2017 and 2018 who were trained in emt advanced program so number of students were in 2017 eight students and 2018 10 students so these certifications helps the students to uh, in their career placement in emt basic level advanced emt as a emt supervisor preceptors educators and training managers after completion of the course in our institution our students are placed throughout the world they are working in tertiary care centers multi speciality hospital emergency care centers and advanced life support ambulances both in india and abroad students are employed in dubai saudi qatar bahrain oman one of our student is present uh, deployed in critical care paramedic in air ambulance others have found employed in medical colleges multi speciality hospital in various parts of india these are all uh, students who trained in our university and they are doing uh, well in their career so our mission is to promote academic awareness for best practice practice models for the emergency care standardization pre hospital and hospital emergency care across india and encourage academic research in emergency medicine so this is uh, 
the team which conducts steps steps is sri ramchandra training on emergency paramedic skills it is a continuing medical education cme platform for paramedic it is organized by paramedic educators it encourages speakers from various institution our uh, institution has initiated steps and uh, we are conducting it every month uh, this is a this is the first one which i am along with my uh, head of the department professor tvr who is also my guide and mentor on my phd research i wish to thank uh, patos uh, research workshop team and professor tv ramkrishnan sir for providing me an op opportunity to present in this research workshop thank you Uh, the next speaker is Dr. Azay Sheikh from Sheikh from Pakistan. Uh, he's with us uh, physically today. Uh, Dr. Azay received his fellowship in Royal College of Emergency Physician in UK in 2017, and has worked in UK for 17 years, and uh, including as a consultant in emergency medicine, <coughs> the Royal Blackburn Hospital. He said that he wanted to come back to Pakistan to uh, now contribute back. Of uh, back his knowledge uh, to be used in uh, Pakistan. He even worked as a consultant physician at the Hamad General Hospital mm. in Qatar. Uh, he currently works as a head of emergency department and consultant emergency and a consultant emergency physician at the Shahid Mohar Mohtarma Benazir Bhutto Institute of Trauma, and he is the lead teaching and education in emergency department. And also the chairperson of the ethics review committee and vice chair of trauma registry committee, uh, Dr. Azir is most appropriate to talk to you about the trauma training and education in Pakistan. Let us welcome Dr. Azir here. Right. Good morning, and thank you very much for Patos uh, to invite me here. I think this is the first time anyone from Pakistan uh, uh, presenting here in Patos. Uh, so thank you. Uh, today, I'm just going to uh, talk about uh, trauma education and training program in Pakistan. <clears throat> It's just a, a brief uh, overview. Um, the contents of the slides may be a little bit variable as per uh, other knowledge um, across the Pakistan. So I have tried my best uh, to obtain the information I could get and uh, verify. So. We will be looking into uh, dynamics of uh, trauma in Pakistan, a few numbers, what are the current education and training programs available, what kind of facilities for the trauma, and what challenges and what we're looking forward. Uh, so globally, as we all know, trauma-related injuries is still uh, the major cause of morbidity and mortality. Approximately 1.3 million people die each year as a result of road traffic crashes and 93% of the world's fatalities on the roads occur in low and middle income countries in Pakistan are falling in one of those categories. Uh, road, road traffic crash um, cost most countries 3% of their gross domestic product. Now that's the map of the Pakistan on the right hand side. It's divided into four major counties or we call provinces. Uh, it's world's fifth most populated country with 229 million uh, people living there, 35% urban and median age, shockingly, is 22.8 years. Uh, the mortality rate uh, related to the road traffic injuries, 15 per 100,000 uh, population in Pakistan, and we ranked at 95th in the world. Trauma is still the second leading cause of disability, 11th leading cause of premature death, and fifth leading cause of healthy year of loss, life lost per thousand people. Now, the type of injuries is from very minor injuries all the way to the natural disaster. On the right hand side, as you can see, the top picture is a bomb blast. And You can see the uh, police officers are uh, helping uh, to evacuate the people around. Uh, the next slide down, or the next picture uh, showing is the earthquake and the building is collapsed completely. Uh, the cars, you can see the people around. So it's a major disaster. And the bottom picture is flooding, which is uh, not very uncommon in Pakistan because of the global change in the uh, climate. 
we still see uh, gunshot injuries very, very frequently where I'm working in Karachi. Uh, but road traffic injuries are is still the top reason for patients to come into the trauma centers. Um, this is the data uh, from a study conducted in one of the biggest uh, area of Pakistan called Punjab. And what they recorded, the total number of road traffic injuries in 2016, 238,785. Among them, 9.5% people died. The latest uh, 2022 data is not validated. However, the total numbers are even more higher. The mortality rate is more higher because of more population, the more vehicles and lack of law enforcement in the country. From the same study, uh, I've put a few slides just to give some idea of that what kind of, uh, what type of injuries and what causes the injuries. So the road traffic injuries is still accounts the most and 67% uh, uh, of the injuries are still minor injuries, but they're all other type of uh, major trauma, head injuries, multiple fractures. Interestingly, as uh, my colleagues was talking about yesterday that uh, in Malaysia, uh, the trauma is the disease of a young. So it's a similar case in Pakistan, as you can see, and male, uh, are more prone to uh, get the trauma uh, as compared to the females. Now, in Pakistan, uh, the different kind of vehicles, uh, it's not only the cars, uh, buses or the vans. We do have a lot of motorcycles, cycles, donkey carts, uh, three wheelers, rickshaw, and they are majority of them who involved in road traffic crashes are motorbikes uh, and the rickshaw. And obviously over speeding, carelessness in the driving are the major reason to cause the trauma in Pakistan. Now, what are the current education and training uh, related to the trauma in Pakistan? It's, it's two uh, type of programs basically. Uh, First one is offered by medical universities. It's the MD program and MS in emergency medicine or general surgery and orthopedic and trauma. Each program is four years and the curriculum does cover uh, emergency medicine as well as the trauma. Uh, not the pre-hospital trauma though, only the hospital trauma. The second one is uh, um, from College of Physicians and Surgeons in Pakistan. It's a fellowship program. Uh, there are several fellowship programs, but I'm just uh, focusing on emergency medicine and general surgery and orthopedic fellowship, because again, they do cover the in-depth knowledge and skills to deal with trauma. Now, there's one more um, um, idea growing in Pakistan. The example is there is the certification provided by a few of the tertiary care hospital. Uh, Indus Hospital has uh, started a um, couple of years ago uh, with one of the U.S. Uh, universities affiliated, John Hopkins, I think. Uh, it's a 12 months program, competency-based. Uh, basically, they just want uh, the doctors who are interested to take an opportunity or to uh, go in the emergency medicine as a career to have some idea that what is it about. So they will teach them few competencies, the knowledge, and how to deal with the trauma and emergencies. Then we've got um, Society of Emergency Medicine, uh, which is recently established, is pretty new, a couple of years ago, as you can see, 2018. Uh, but they're working really, really hard, and I think they're playing a very vital role uh, in educational activities. They have already uh, started the activities like webinars, seminars, workshops, uh, which helps uh, to develop a culture in the country that emergency medicine and the trauma needs education and needs some more focus. Um, then People talk about uh, trauma life support courses, as Kevin mentioned about uh, US. Obviously, ATLS is adopted from uh, US. 
all across the globe. Uh, so it's the CPSP, which is the College of Emergency Medicine, uh, they've got accreditation from uh, College of American College of Surgeons to administer a TLSN program in Pakistan. Um, and it is mandatory course. ATLS is required uh, before you can sit the exit examination of fellowship. If you don't have the ATLS, then you cannot sit the exam. Now, this is very interesting. Uh, Pakistan Lifesavers program. Um, it's, uh, it's basically the program run by the Al Khan University, uh, which is a private hospital in Pakistan in a cooperation with few uh, US based universities and some government involvement. The idea behind is to educate the teenagers from the school to the university level to teach them the basic life uh, support, how to do the CPR and how to stop the bleeding if they found someone in the community. They're aiming to train around 10 million Pakistani people or the students. Sorry, is it? Is it working? Yeah. Oh, sorry, I was. Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay. My apologies. My apologies. Okay. Um, now the several others courses, uh, life support courses, the trauma care support uh, uh, courses conducted by NGOs, local hospitals, um, few private companies providing across the Pakistan. They're a bit patchy, okay, but they are existing there. Simulation programs where I'm working, we've got simulation program and there are other universities and the hospital across Pakistan who are running uh, the workshops uh, to train the doctors and the staff how to look after the emergency patients and the trauma care. Now, public awareness is very, very important. Uh, it's, it's not hugely been uh, done in Pakistan, but there are some programs on the media um, related to the awareness of the road traffic injuries and what to do, whether to wear the helmet and put the seat belts on and etc. So there is some work. Now, what kind of facilities are available in uh, Pakistan related to the trauma? So there are trauma centers in Pakistan in most of the cities, but shockingly not all functioning. If they are functioning, then they are understaffed or the facilities are not available. The basic needs are not there for the trauma care. <clears throat> ambulance services, probably Kevin would be interested to know the ambulance services is not very well organized. It's uh, only in the major big cities, okay, urban areas, the rural areas is still struggling. If there is any casualty, either they will die there or they will have to walk several kilometers or they will have to have a motorbike or any kind of basic vehicle to get transported to the nearest facilities. Now, this is the map showing, as I mentioned earlier, that there are functional and non-functional trauma centers. This is the example from one of the biggest uh, county of Pakistan. The white, uh, the, the total names as shown are the cities, the quite few cities there. The white one showing that there are no trauma centers at all, and they are big cities in the county. Uh, the dark green um, shades showing uh, that there are trauma centers and the others with the lines, white and green lines showing that patchy, there are functioning and non-functioning. So that's the situation. So the building exists, but the staffing and the funding is not there to run the trauma centers. Now I will talk a little bit about where I'm coming from or where I work recently is a one of the major uh, or the busiest trauma centers in the Karachi, uh, which covers the whole region, not only the Karachi city, but it's got quite, um, it covers the two counties basically. Um, it's 
as I said, it's busy. We see around 190,000 of the new patients, trauma <laughs> patients. It's exclusive trauma center. So all the patients with the medical problems does not get registered here because there's a hospital or the emergency department next door where they will be registered. So the numbers are exclusive for the trauma patients. Um, among those, 10 to 12% is a major trauma and it's a big challenge. I worked in UK and um, those, um, uh, as Prof uh, Courts knows that how does it work if a trauma is coming, you will be pre-alerted and you have a trauma team ready to take the patient. That's not the case in Pakistan. Through the doors, anytime 10 patients in a bomb blast or the bus rolled over, that kind of thing, at least once a day, you will see at least once a day. That's the intensity. Lack of triaging. Um, I wouldn't say lack of triaging, but it's not very advanced triage system. Okay. So it's like priority one, two, three. And basically, if you don't see the patient, then you are in trouble. So you have to see every patient, whether they are in a minor category or the major category. That's the bit of politics and the background of the country. Um, this hospital is providing uh, free of cost care right from the admission all the way up to the rehabilitation and the discharge. And in ER, we are well staffed. We've got the equipment required and we've got uh, all the surgical specialties needed for any trauma center 24-7, including theaters and ICU backup. Now, Trauma registry is something we're working on. We have uh, developed uh, in-house. Uh, we had the trauma registry from US, but it was very, very expensive. The, so the trust has to stop it after a year or so. Now, locally, the IT department has basically copied more or less similar trauma registry, but nobody know how to collect the data or the good quality of data as uh, Prof Coates uh, was giving a great lecture to us yesterday. So we are looking forward <laughs> to have some help in uh, trauma registry. Uh, then we've got our own trauma uh, team. Uh, it's been modified as per local needs. Uh, we've got uh, in-house audit and research department uh, it, the, the work has just started, so we, we are still waiting to produce something uh, from emergency and trauma point of view. Um, we've got a department uh, who uh, are in uh, looking into the evidence-based medical guidelines, uh, the, um, the producing the care bundles and the pathways, um, just to make sure that we are following the right pathways and guidelines. Um, as per international uh, rules. Uh, we've got uh, emergency teaching uh, faculty which look after the emergency medicine doctors as well as the staff. We want to make sure the basic competencies required for the emergency care of the trauma patient uh, being given to all the uh, nursing staff, paramedics, as well as the um, doctors. Challenges, <laughs> okay. It's a long list, uh, but I just put them in as a road safety related, as we all know, speeding. There are no speed cameras, only on the highways. Um, uh, the driving under influence of different drugs is, is still there. Distracting driving, the mobile use is one of the killer. The people, you see them, they've got mobile and they are driving. Very unsafe, dangerous. Um, People still use helmets, but not everyone would use. Seat belts are there, I think, just for highways, I think, because the police will stop you if you don't have it. Um, but the culture is developing. Child restraints, only few, maybe less than a percent would use the child restraints. Otherwise, it, it does not exist in the country. Unsafe vehicles are still there, as I mentioned, um, uh, donkey carts, uh, three wheeler vehicles, um, they are on the road, not following uh, the road uh, safety, so they can, they does cause a lot of um, trauma. Uh, this can all be improved, as I mentioned at the bottom, uh, if the government uh, takes some more strict initiatives about it. The pre-hospital, 
a uh, lot of challenges um, uh, we've got as you can see the rickshaw that is the three wheeler and it's kind of ambulance in pakistan uh, it, because that uh, that is the way pe people can get easily to the hospital because of the congestion if you are coming in the ambulance which is uh, as you can see at the ambulance it's uh, one of the uh, ngo a uh, company in pakistan uh, they run uh, that one uh, the four uh, four wheeler um, but that has got no facility inside you will be lucky if you have oxygen cylinder in this ambulance there are some government um, ambulances uh, which are equipped but they are very few not a lot um so <clears throat> emergency uh, care system pre hospital needs to be established that's lacking in the country a hospital related as i already mentioned that there are hospital but non functioning trauma centers staffing level is very low a basic equipments and the resources are missing the competencies are not up to the mark and there is a lack of unified guidelines and pathways as kevin you mentioned that should be a universal or the national guidelines so everyone knows what to do and the same competencies and what i say that there is a need again from the government level to promote emergency medicine and trauma care to overcome all these challenges now what is the future vision we definitely need to develop a pre hospital emergency care system which is integrated all across the country then we need to have some kind of certification in trauma care to have some basic competencies done that way a uh, telemedicine is another uh, good way i have come across in pakistan uh, the emergency medicine in pediatrics uh, they use this telemedicine and i was amazed the way they can work because i never imagined how you can use telemedicine in emergency medicine but when i looked at it it's amazing so the doctors sitting in a room and they are connected through zoom links or special links and they can examine the patient they can pick so, so many signs or at least they will triage them whether they need to be in a local rural area or they can be sent somewhere or whatever emergency uh, treatment is needed so yeah so this is what um, we're looking forward to start um there is a need for integrated national and regional trauma care system because at the moment it does not exist on the government level Uh, the trauma care guidelines and pathway nationally availability for standard care as i mentioned and there there is a need for the national trauma uh, audit and research department to be developed now the golden hour i think as uh, kevin you mentioned the 45 minutes uh, so the golden hour for the trauma patient needs to be promoted because it does not exist in pakistan people don't know about a week ago i was talking to a surgeon about the golden hour and they had no idea what is this so we need to promote that golden hour uh, that what the importance of it and obviously if we start teaching kids in a school as a curriculum what is the awareness of the road traffic then maybe things will get better in the future reference Okay, Dr. Son, could you hear me? Yes. Okay. Could you hear me now? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I can hear you very well. Uh, so you you can uh, running this session now, please. Okay. Thank you. And uh, next speaker is Dr. Pravita Lahaku. And she is a graduate from Changmei University and working as a attending physician in emergency medicine of Changmei uh, University Hospital. and her topic is trauma education and training program in Thailand. Uh, please welcome Dr. Pavita uh, Lahauka. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Good morning everyone. I'm so honored to be a representative from Thailand. Uh, I want to share our, our experiences with all of you. Uh, I would like to begin with a brief overview. The trauma education program in Thailand can be sorted into pre-hospital trauma care 
and in hospital trauma. The pre-hospital trauma care is based on pre-hospital trauma life support, or PHTLS, and the in-hospital trauma care is based on advanced trauma life support course for doctors and advanced initial trauma care for emergency nurse practitioners. When we look at the types of trainees, they are both undergraduate and postgraduate groups of medical personnel. The undergrads like medical students, nursing students, and paramedic students are taught the concept of trauma care while they are in their student programs. After they graduate, uh, there are courses that they can take, such as ATLS for doctors, PHTLS, and the Advanced Initial Trauma Care for Emergency Nurse Practitioners, as well as advanced course for surgeons, such as the ASSET. We also offer courses for non-medical personnel. Uh, people who are interested in becoming emergency medical responder can take a course and be certified under the National Institute for Emergency Medicine of Thailand. There are calls for, for uh, lay rescuers for basic life support and first aid. We also have calls for the park rangers to be a first responder and the rescue, as well as the wilderness advanced first aid for anyone who is interested to learn. Okay, now let's look at these various courses in more detail. The medical students are taught the concept of ATLS uh, during their clinical years. We provide knowledge in lectures and test them on case simulation. Everyone is trained to perform fast and e-fast ultrasound, and we teach them about the moving techniques for trauma patients, and then they will become our assistants for, to teach the laypersons later. Next is the Advanced Trauma Life Support Course for Doctors, which has been implemented in Thailand for more than, for almost 20 years. It is conducted by the Royal College of Surgeons of Thailand. Uh, doctors in this course are surgeons, emergency physicians, orthopedists, and also general practitioners. The participants gain skills and knowledge in uh, assessing the patient and with better, better quality of care. And you can see that they are having the hands-on sessions about the emergency procedures such as ICD placement. We also have the adaptation of this course. It is called the Advanced Initial Trauma Care for Emergency Nurse Practitioners because of the shortage of uh, physicians and still increasing number of paramedics in Thailand. So we train nurses to become uh, an emergency nurse practitioner so they can give the diagnosis and treat the patient at the scene and then uh, transfer them to the higher level of care. So the concept contains the uh, level of knowledge as ATLS but adapts it for the nurses. You can see that our ENPs can perform fast and e-fast ultrasound. They can detect intra-abdominal abdomin bleeding and then uh, notify the transfer hospital for, for what they, they have found. And seven years ago, Thailand has its first pre-hospital trauma life support course and began to teach more and more medical personnel about the treatment for trauma patients in the pre-hospital settings. It is also <coughs> under the care of Royal College of Surgeons of Thailand. This course is open for doctors, nurses, uh, paramedics, and also EMTs. We now have five uh, training centers in Thailand. Two are in Bangkok, and the other three are at uh, three different regions of the country, which is here I'm from, from Chiang Mai. Okay. This course uh, involves a lot of uh, hands-on sessions about the skills they are taught and also the extrication techniques for doctors, nurses, paramedics, and EMTs. Okay, they will have to attend the scenario cases and uh, pass the practical sessions. The last one for medical personnel is the Advanced Surgical Skills for Exposure in Trauma or the ASSET. This is the advanced course for surgeons to attend. It is a two-day course 
for surgeons, they will see the case simulation about the trauma situation and they will have to perform and increase their surgical skills in trauma patients. Now we will move on to the cost for non-medical personnel. It, they are usually under the care of National Institute for Emergency Medicine and anyone who is interested in becoming EMRs can take this course and they will be certified by the National Institute for Emergency Medicine. The volunteer will uh, attend the course. It is a very short course, only 45 to 60 hours of training. And after that, they will have to attend cases at least 10 times in the real situations within three months after the training. And they can also uh, attend more uh, courses and knowledge and become EMT later. Okay, they start with the lectures and then move on to the hands-on session, such as extricating patients out of the car accident safely. This shows the attendees being evaluated while utilizing the helmet removing techniques with the C-spine immobilization. So they will do this and then after the training, they will have to attend the real case situations and they will be uh, certified later. Okay, we also have courses for lay persons. This slide shows that these are the high school students who attend the course for basic life support and first aid. They will learn how to stop bleeding, do a basic splint, and also the BLS and using AEDs. Okay, this is uh, what I like to show. I think it's very interesting. There is a need to train those who work in many remote areas in Thailand, including the national parks. We have courses for park rangers to become an EMR to respond in any emergency situations in the remote areas. They will learn how to save lives, the BLS, the basic splints, and even rescue techniques. This, you can see that they are acting as the EMRs and sometimes they will have to adapt what they had. This is the bamboo stick, and then they will have to adapt it to become a splint, and even a stretcher. This became a spine immobilization, and then they will have to remove the victim out of the wilderness areas, and maybe ask for EMS to come to help, maybe from a helicopter or the car EMS later. And recently, we had uh, our first Wilderness Advanced First Aid course for anyone who is interested to learn. They can join and uh, will be certified under the National Institute for Emer Emergency Medicine too. It is a four-day course and that will teach them how to assess the patient in any emergency situation, including trauma scenes and uh, emergency medical situations such as drowning and anaphylaxis. So they will have the lectures and then move on to the hands-on session on basic splints, how to stop the bleeding. You can see that they can learn how to apply the tunicate. And it may look funny, but uh, this simulated patient is packed to prevent hypothermia and is prepared for a long period of evacuation because there are many remote areas in Thailand, which is really difficult to access they may have to walk about five hours to, to get to the nearest health center. So they will have to pack the patient properly and then move them by, maybe carry them and walk for many hours. So many of them have hypothermia and maybe dislocation of the fracture. So we teach them how to do that in the remote areas and wilderness areas. And we also uh, offer the renewal course for ATLS and PHTLS providers. And lastly, what I'd like to show is what we have had for almost 10 years. It is the EMS Rally, which is a competition uh, of the basic and advanced care team in Thailand. Everyone can join and we will find the uh, provincial champion and then the regional champions will be invited to join the national competition. Uh, we started since 2011. 
you can see this is not the real case. <laughs> this is only simulated patient. She is the nursing student who, who is becoming volunteer. She acts like she was paid about a million won, but she only got maybe 50,000 won for, for the budget, but she acts really good. And the, the competitors who attend this competition we have to do like the real life situation that they have to see the patient. Uh, they will use the splints and extrication techniques and they will be evaluated by our evaluators. We, all, we not only have the trauma case only, but there are variations of situ situation and scenarios that we have made. Maybe sometimes the hazmat with trauma, they will have to uh, donning and doffing the PPE properly. They have to read the placards and respond to that hazmat situation and treat the patient at the scene, then send patient to the hospital safely. There are evaluators who are emergency physicians and e emergency nurse practitioners who, who will be evaluator and evaluate the team. They will have to use their own uh, equipments for, for their uh, convenient and then they will have to act as if this is the real case. They are also like the situation like uh, water rescue and drowning situation, but you can see Thailand's always smiling <laughs> if it if it <laughs> is drowned, it's still smiling, I don't know why. <laughs> we don't know to do anything, we just smile. Okay, even if we drown. <laughs> okay, so the champion will uh, we will be prized the trophy and uh, the prize money. So they are very exciting and this creates a lot of awareness. So they would like to improve their skills and would like to be the winner, to be an honor for their team. And also the regional winners will be joining the national EMS rally every year. So the national EMS rally ran every year until the COVID came. So we stopped for uh, now about two years that we have, haven't uh, get this competition. And you can see that every team from all over the country are, are attended this competition, not only to compete, but after the competition is over, we also offer the, the educational sessions to teach in any scenarios to enhance the knowledge of all the participants. So this is, I think it's interesting for them to, to uh, practice their skills and then compete and then re-evaluate their skills and learn and improve again. Okay, so this slide, this plays the summary of the trauma education and training program in Thailand that I have presented today. We also have courses for laypersons, EMR and EMTs, paramedics and emergency nurse practitioners, nurses, doctors, EPs, and also surgeons. So um, thank you very much for giving me opportunity to share this information. And if you have any questions or idea, feel free to share with me. And maybe Dr. Sata and Dr. Brinja would help me <laughs> answer the questions if we can't. <laughs> thank you. And when we move to the next speaker, uh, Dr. Alma Ganzenfer. And Dr. Alma Ganzenfer has completed his MBBS from Karachi University and subsequently spent 13 years in the United Kingdom and at initially in surgery and subsequently emergency medicine before moving to the UAE in 2015 uh, as an emergency medicine physician. And his his subspecialty interest in the disaster medicine, and he also he was a co-chair of, of trauma and the Zoe Military Hospital and chief editor of the Emirate Society of Emergency Medicine. And Dr. Gendenfer has also a keen interest in uh, medical leadership and and has completed the Edward Jenner Leadership Degree from the NHS Leadership Academy. And his topic is trauma education and training program in UAE. Uh, because he can uh, go to the Korea, so he will be on line presentation. Uh, please welcome Dr. Alma Gansenfer. Uh, dear Patos, uh, good afternoon. Uh, and thank you for having the United Arab Emirates uh, 
uh, represented in PATOS 2022. Unfortunately, due to unforeseen circumstances, I couldn't attend physically the PATOS, but hopefully we'll do that uh, next year. Uh, but I've tried to uh, provide some insight into trauma setup, education, training, uh, and how the trauma system works uh, in the UAE. Uh, so for those who don't know me, my name is Dr. Omar Ghazanfar. I'm an emergency physician uh, with a special interest in humanitarian disaster medicine, and I work at the event clinic uh, Abu Dhabi. So the trauma system uh, in the UAE. The trauma system is a key element of any emergency management system, uh, which was essentially non-existent in the UAE until about 2010. Uh, a trauma-interested group in Abu Dhabi consisting of uh, both emergency physicians and trauma surgeons decided to work on this with the belief uh, that establishing a trauma system in, in Abu Dhabi and then the rest of the UAE would help to reduce mortality and mobility, as well as to re uh, revolutionize trauma care in the Abu Dhabi and in the country. Uh, so based on that, a trauma committee was established in coordination with the Abu Dhabi Health Authority in 2010-11 uh, to serve as a, a consultative forum to provide effective advice on current and future directions of the trauma system in Abu Dhabi. This committee aimed to plan, organize, implement and monitor the development of a state-of-the-art system uh, for trauma consisting of all co components of a trauma system including prevention, outreach and, and education, pre-hospital trauma care, inter-facility transfer, organization of trauma at hospital levels, uh, educational trauma programs, rehabilitation, establishment of a trauma registry, performance and patient safety uh, PIPs programs, uh, upgrading the rural trauma care, and finally focusing on research and scholarship. This aimed to address the daily demands of trauma care within the Emirates and form the basis of preparedness for disasters within the healthcare system uh, in the UAE and in Abu Dhabi. Uh, so uh, the Department of Health in Abu Dhabi identified trauma as one of the top 10 public health priorities because of the impact of its uh, medical and, and economics. Uh, and trauma is the second leading cause of death in the UAE, which results both in physical and psychological impacts on patients, their families, and uh, uh, at society as well. Uh, so regarding, uh, so how, what did the Department of Health do in terms of uh, developing this? So regarding to a, sort of responding to a growing problem with trauma uh, and challenges to trauma care stakeholders included the Public Health Department, uh, Research Div Division of the Department of Health, Zayed Military Hospital in Abu Dhabi, uh, Major Saha, the public sector facilities, Abu Dhabi Police Ambulance, which provide a majority of the pre-hospital services, UAE University. And some of the stakeholders from the private healthcare sector developed a vision to address the issue of trauma care in the Emirate of Abu Dhabi and in the UAE. And the plan was to look at trauma as a continuum, which begins right from injury prevention uh, right through to rehabilitation. And this spectrum would cover all dimensions of system performance. Uh, so the Abu Dhabi Trauma System Initiative is one of the most important public health initiatives started uh, within the Department of Health and the basic components of the trauma system were adopted from the optimal care of the injured victim uh, 2006, uh, which were dissected and prioritized according to the needs and personal experiences of the member of the team and the uh, requirements uh, of the system within the, the Emirates. Uh, you know, looking at health, high priority would be pre-hospital injury prevention, uh, establishment of trauma registry, a PIPs program, rehab, medium priority was hospital organization, burns management, uh, management of trauma in, in the rural centers, and then uh, followed by research, uh, organ transplantation, and, and so on. Uh, so as the initiative gained traction uh, and a diversity of interest groups, different components were assigned to different subcommittees. Uh, which further scrutinized strategies and approaches which could be implemented uh, within the uh, within the Emirates. Uh, membership was voluntary and, and was uh, essentially allocated on the base of uh, area of expertise and interest. Uh, after the organization of the subcommittees around different components, the members worked aggressively uh, and voluntarily to create strategies and formulation the trauma system in the Emirates. It was envisioned that there is an insatiable desire for organized trauma system from within the Emirates. Uh, which can then integrate into a full care trauma system uh, within the country. Uh, 
So as a cornerstone of the trauma system, the Abu Dhabi Trauma System Initiative team supported by the Department of Health work with a constancy of purpose to establish the, the first Middle Eastern uh, multi-centered centralized trauma registry, the first of its kind in its region, uh, using the collector tool. Uh, introducing such a crucial tool was useful in gathering continuous standardized coded information to analyze and improve quality of care for trauma patients and assist in appropriate allocation of resources. It also aimed to provide, uh, identify common risk factors for different types of injuries and target uh, intervention strategies to reduce the overall burden of injury as well. Uh, so the objective uh, of the trauma registry was to facilitate and improve patient care by uh, locating and accurately producing information rele relevant to patients' clinical problems, to provide online summaries of diagnostic and therapeutic tools, uh, to establish a source of developing risk factors for events and injuries, to define variables to correlate with morbidity and mortality, to determine logistical and manpower requirements uh, for the uh, community's need for trauma, uh, and to provide continuous monitoring for project planning for the care of the critically Ill injured patient due to trauma. In terms of, uh, so this uh, century trauma registry has been established. Uh, it's got more than 30,000 patients onto the registry, it's about 11 hospitals within the Emirates, which are contributing to the registry program. And they have uh, trauma registrars as well. Uh, and now over the last 12 months, the trauma registry data has been fed into PATOS as well. Uh, with respect to educational endeavors within the country, uh, emergency medicine residency program was started and emergency medicine Emirates Society of Emergency Medicine was established about 10 years ago, uh, which was a strong proponent of establishing emergency medicine residency programs uh, within Abu Dhabi. So there are currently multiple emergency medicine residency programs in Abu Dhabi, Alain, Sharjah and Dubai uh, with comprehensive training in trauma management. The initial residents were trained to give the Arab board exam as their exit qualification. But with system maturity, the Emirati Board of Emergency Medicine has also now been established. Uh, most of the programs uh, for residency are accredited by the ACGME in the US and provide credibility to the emergency medicine teaching and training within the UAE. Uh, in terms of talking about the hospital emergency medical services, National Ambulance is one of the largest authorized providers of uh, the AHA and uh, the National Association of EMT and an authorized provider for American Safety and Health Institute. They've established education training centers offering various certifications and life support and other types of emergency medicine responses. They're also an authorized National Registry of Emergency Medical Technicians recertification. Their educators follow the National Association of EMS Educators methodology in delivering EMS education and have extensive experience in teaching people how to save lives and have certified hundreds of thousands of people across the UAE and within the Middle East. They adopt a quality centered approach and focus on achieving academic uh, excellence. Their education and training division operates within five main areas. And these include international accreditations, EMS educations, organizations and individual training community outreach programs and various EMS projects. Uh, to remain current on the ever expanding knowledge and skills required for an EMS provider, the National uh, Ambulance pride themselves on being a one-stop shop solution for EMS practitioners and, and medical professionals where they can achieve the certifications for their basic and advanced disciplines, including EMT, paramedic certification, EMS certification, and profession development CME training. <laughs> Their center offers blended mix of online and classroom learning via an interactive learning environment to pro practice and maintain life-saving knowledge and skills in accordance with international best practices. Using the latest technology, including simulation-based learning on a variety of EMS clinical scenarios, directive real-time feedback devices, online e-learning, virtual learning and remote skills verification to support learning and course objectives. The Department of Health and the Emirates Society of Emergency Medicine has been responsible for hosting many world class conferences with trauma focused workshops. And some of the workshops have included topics like disaster management, advanced hazmat life support, point of care ultrasound, advanced uh, burn support and pre-hospital ECMO. Multiple centers within the UAE are now accredited for AHS approved life support courses in the UAE, as well as the American College of Surgeons ATLS courses. These courses also include things like basic disaster life support. 
Uh, these courses are recommended by the DOH for all emergency physicians and are part of the privileging requirements for all emergency department doctors within the country. Uh, future projects. The Department of Health and the Harvard Medical Faculty Physicians at the Beth Israel Technus Medical Center have announced a collaboration in the fields of disaster medicine and disaster management. The memorandum of understanding builds on the Department of Health's ongoing efforts in the area of emergency planning and management, including the Istijaba online platform and the Abu Dhabi uh, pandemic emergency response manuals. Through this a memorandum of understanding and other efforts, the department seeks to build the capacity of the healthcare sector and upscale the medical forces in the areas of disaster and emergency readiness. The two uh, entities have identified areas of mutual interest and collaboration, which includes academic and educational exchanges and rotations from medical practitioners, students and faculty. These, this will also entail cooperative programming in the areas of disaster mitigation, preparedness, response and recovery. These exchanges and programming will advance the Department of Health's objectives in strengthening the research capacity and infrastructure for postgraduate medical education, including a potential program to train clinician investigators. The MOU will also see the development of the Abu Dhabi Center of Disaster Medicine that will take a lead in enhancing the health sector's readiness for potential disasters and emergencies. Research. So multiple research measures are underway currently using extensive Abu Dhabi trauma registry to improve trauma education and quality within the UAE and to improve trauma services within the country and to practice trauma medicine in line with global international standards. So in essence, trauma management has grown exponentially in the UAE after the trauma system was established in 2010-11. This has included the establishment of the trauma registry, accredited emergency department training programs and advanced trauma and disaster life support courses. This boards very well for the man management of trauma within the country with the comprehensive measures taken by the Department of Health to improve trauma uh, training as well as trauma education in the country. So this is my personal email. If you have any questions, please, uh, please ask me uh, again. I'm sorry I couldn't uh, attend the, uh, the uh, meeting face to face, but hopefully we'll be able to do that uh, next time. But in the meantime, uh, that's my email and I'm happy to answer any questions uh, you might have with respect to trauma education and training uh, within the country and, and in general. Thank you for that. Again, thank you, uh, Petos, for inviting me and, and I hope uh, the workshop is a great success. Thank you. Okay. Now uh, we move to next speaker. Okay. Uh, the next speaker is Dr. Leu, and he graduated from Vienna National University of Ho, Ho Chi Minh City and working as an emergency physician in Chona Hospital. And his topic is trauma education and training program in Vienna. And please welcome Dr. Leu. Uh, good evening. Uh, uh, good morning. Uh, on uh, Patrick Fellows, I'm Dr. Hill from uh, <laughs> Uh, Thong Nhat Hospital, Vietnam, and uh, I would like to present uh, trauma education and training in Vietnam. The content of my uh, presentation uh, include uh, overview uh, healthcare system and education uh, program in Vietnam, international cooperation, trauma care training in Vietnam and Thong Nhat Hospital, and the last conclusion. Uh, Globally, uh, trauma is uh, the ninth most common lead to death worldwide, and uh, is it the, the third greatest cause of the uh, global burden of disease and injury? And traffic accident remain the biggest single cause of fatalities in Vietnam. Uh, you can see here is the, the real picture of uh, Vietnam uh, traffic uh, in every day, in every uh, rush hours in Vietnam. It's, uh, yeah. So uh, road traffic accident killed approximately uh, over uh, uh, 14,000 people in Vietnam a year. And it is the leading cause death among those aged uh, between 15 and uh, uh, 29 years. Yeah. And this is the beer uh, production and beer consumption in Vietnam uh, in 2015. Uh, Vietnamese people consume in, in total of about 7.8 billion liters. So, and uh, uh, that's uh, why where many, many Vietnamese patients admit to hospital uh, after using uh, alcohol. Yeah. 
it's a big problem. This is uh, the graphic about traffic accident in Vietnam from uh, 2016 to 2020. Uh, the total case, uh, the death and the injury, uh, you can see here uh, on uh, of the numbers uh, decreased uh, dramatically uh, over that time. About healthcare system in Vietnam uh, are divided into four primary levels. You can see the, uh, the primary uh, as a, a four level. Mm, the first one is uh, central level. Uh, it's a national general and uh, specialist hospital or uh, institutes or medical university hospital. Uh, we have about uh, nearly uh, 50 hospitals. Uh, the second level is a uh, provincial uh, level, uh, over 400. And the third level is a uh, district level. And uh, the last is a uh, commune, uh, commune level. There are lots, there are lots of uh, uh, commune clinics in, uh, in on around Vietnam. And Besides, uh, uh, Vietnam also had uh, nearly 200 private hospitals, uh, but uh, it's mostly located in urban areas and uh, big cities. And our healthcare system got uh, some uh, advantages and disadvantages. Uh, about uh, advantages, uh, almost all of the preventive services are free uh, and widely covered uh, of public healthcare sector. And then insurance, government insurance cover about uh, 77 of total population. And I think it's also uh, uh, is a disadvantage too, uh, because uh, uh, insurance in Vietnam is uh, voluntary. People can choose uh, buy the, the insurance or not. We also are developing telemedicine uh, over the past few years because uh, COVID-19. Uh, so, uh, in uh, many cases, many uh, severe patients uh, can get the consultant from a uh, uh, professor or uh, from the big city to, 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 to say that. And it invest uh, uh, improvement uh, over the past few years. Yeah. How about the disadvantages? You can see here the, the real picture in Vietnamese hospital. Overcrowded. Uh, there are a lot of patients in uh, level one uh, uh, center or hospital. Uh, sometimes um, one uh, one bed uh, can have uh, three patients. Uh, some patients have to you know uh, have to stay in the in the crowd if uh, the the the, the uh, facility or the hospital is uh, crowded and. Uh, the second disadvantage is limitation of health service quality and the budget for health care system in uh, not met the actual needs. Um, the next uh, disadvantage is man, man distribution of human resources for health. Uh, my medical staff uh, prefer to stay in a uh, big city rather than a uh, uh, rural area or a smaller hospital. And lack of uh, systematic CM CME for trauma care. And uh, training program uh, not yet synchronized uh, from uh, uh, many hospitals and many centers. And uh, lack of trauma care coordinate system. Uh, about trauma care center, uh, we uh, got uh, uh, several level one. Is it the biggest uh, center, uh, trauma centers in Vietnam? There are one or three uh, in uh, uh, some big cities like in uh, Hanoi, Ho Chi Minh City, or uh, Huế. A level two, level two trauma center is a, um, a provincial, uh, provincial hospital, and. Uh, Level uh, three or four is a uh, uh, district hospital. EMS system uh, in Vietnam, we uh, we call, uh, we had uh, the number is one one five. We 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 uh, also call it one one five center. And but uh, the si system is only available in some uh, uh, larger province province and cities, and just respond about ten percent of on patient costs. 91 percent of victims 
are rescued by uh, traffic participants or by themselves. Yeah, uh, and just about five percent um, uh, patient uh, got the emergency services. Yeah. You can see he here is the the one one five center or EMS system uh, in Vietnam is uh, rescuing a, a trauma patient. Yeah, this is maybe the, the, the before COVID nineteen. Um, they are not wearing a mask. Yeah. About uh, 60% of traffic accident victims are transported uh, to hospital within the first six hours, uh, while uh, nearly 10% went to hospital after uh, three days. Medical education program in uh, uh, Vietnam uh, have, uh, uh, have many uh, steps. Um, Students uh, got to the uh, medical university and uh, they have to uh, complete the general doctor after six years. And uh, after that, uh, they uh, can uh, uh, apply uh, for work in a hospital or uh, continue to, uh, to uh, uh, study in the, the hospital uh, with the uh, specialist doctor level one or MSc. And uh, after that, they can uh, continue to, to study uh, to uh, PhD or specialist level two. This is a, a review in trauma care training uh, in, in Vietnam. Yeah. Uh, you can see here is the uh, trauma lesson by a subject in the uh, curriculum of uh, Hanoi Medical University uh, about uh, uh, Two to four uh, percent of the total credits is a uh, trauma session in the total uh, uh, in the in the total uh, uh, lessons. Is the level uh, uh, specialist level one and specialist uh, level two uh, program uh, like uh, and in surgery and anesthesia they have about uh, eight to uh, 22 percent of the total credits uh, in on lessons about uh, trauma. Vietnam um, have co cooperated with uh, uh, some countries and some uh, uh, trauma centers in the uh, all around the world like USA, France, Japan, Korea and um, in Vietnam we we have many uh, uh, hospitals that connected together you know, to, to, to build a trauma, uh, trauma system uh, like uh, you're right, uh, in uh, Ho Chi Minh City and uh, uh, many hospitals in uh, Hanoi and Hue and uh, Da Nang, etc. There are some causes about uh, trauma care and trauma training uh, were held from uh, uh, over the past uh, decades. Uh, in, uh, uh, 2012, uh, a primary trauma uh, care course uh, were, held, were held in Hanoi and Ninh Bình. A total of uh, oh, uh, 121 candidates took part in the, the course. This is uh, the, the image of the uh, training course for instructors at Chorai Hospital. This is in Bạch Mai Hospital. In terms of first aid quality, uh, Viet Đức Hospital, so uh, Viet Đức is still one of the largest trauma center in Vietnam. Just 5% of bone uh, immobil immobilization and 7% of hemorrhage prevention is, uh, is correct, I'm sorry. Um, and according to uh, the ICA, uh, over 61% uh, of um, the band bandaging appropriate uh, the orders uh, in uh, inappropriate and uh, it's still bleeding and meanwhile about 50 uh, percent of the bone fixation is not correct it not it uh, do not meet uh, the requirement uh, this is a, a study about the the outcomes of trauma education workshop in uh, Vietnam and uh, uh, the workshop is uh, held in uh, one day and 
uh, after the course, um, all of the all the candidates uh, show the, the high uh, uh, certification with uh, about uh, the total uh, the, the average score is uh, four over uh, five. This year we shot in uh, Torrey Hospital. Torrey uh, Hospital is, is the biggest uh, um, the biggest hospital in uh, Ho Chi Minh City, and uh, uh, we saw that a uh, uh, last year score. Glasgow uh, coma scale uh, uh, less than eight and uh, uh, blood pressure uh, less than uh, fifty and IH score over twenty five. It was associated uh, with in uh, in hospital mortality. And uh, is it one uh, of the other uh, research about uh, injury and pre-hospital trauma care in Hanoi, Vietnam? In Thống Nhất Hospital, uh, from uh, 2017, uh, we uh, analyzed that uh, there were about um, uh, 3,500 to uh, over uh, 5,000 uh, trauma patients admitted in uh, our hospital a year. That means it's about uh, uh, 10 to uh, 15 patients admitted to uh, hospital um, a day because of uh, trauma. And in 2020, the, the, the number is uh, decreased uh, because of the COVID-19. Uh, when patients uh, uh, get into our AD, uh, we, we use the COS protocol uh, to uh, assess the patient. COS means uh, comprehensive life support. And all of the medical staff uh, have to remember and practice in every patient daily. And after that, uh, severe cases were reported in a daily meeting and uh, uh, with uh, the consult of the uh, department's director. All of the junior doctors uh, uh, practice in uh, the ED uh, have to discuss it. Clinical case uh, study every Wednesday included uh, trauma patients. And uh, in trauma patient, we um, got many uh, uh, techniques and many protocols to assess the patient uh, uh, from from the beginning to uh, uh, when to the patient uh, get into another department like uh, EFAT, uh, blue protocol, POCUS, TBI protocol, or cup blue. And when the cup blue is activated, uh, we use we use the ATOS protocol. Uh, uh, to 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 treat the cardiac arrest uh, trauma patient, and uh, the trauma team uh, were activated uh, immediately, and uh, maybe the, the, uh, we can open the airway or insert the chest tube, um, transfer the patient to the, the DOR within uh, just five or ten minutes. Uh, since uh, uh, two thousand and thirty. About 40 COS basic trauma training courses uh, uh, held by Thống Nhất COS team and about uh, a thousand healthcare providers from uh, uh, level 3 or 4 uh, hospital uh, or district hospital or uh, other clinics uh, uh, took part in the, in the course and we uh, supply them uh, skills and uh, documents. This year the image of uh, uh, some course in Thống Nhất Hospital. And there are some, um, you know, some um, romantic case that we uh, uh, say the patient from severe trauma, uh, like uh, uh, heart, um, heart puncture because of a uh, stab it. Yeah, this patient here uh, uh, too. This is a boy uh, fell from the, the third floor and uh, uh, he was stuck in in, uh, in the fence, and uh, we have to consult with uh, Children One Hospital and save him. And we got some uh, uh, study and uh, some um, lecture report in uh, uh, many uh, conference of uh, emergency medicine. Here is some uh, uh, the images. And finally, uh, in conclusion, uh, I can say that trauma is one of the common leads to death in Vietnam. 
further an EMS system on trauma need improving and trauma training programs should be cycled right in uh, uh, Vietnam in the future. And thank you for your attention. Uh, the session number five is Pater's open meeting. Uh, this open meeting session will be moderated by our Pater's chair, Dr. Sang Do Shin. Okay, Dr. Shin, please. Okay, uh, it's time to have a uh, Pater's open meeting. Uh, actually, the open meeting means the uh, 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 Petos uh, to be open to more people uh, who are interested in the participating project. But I think it's uh, that open and not closing because uh, yesterday members are the same today's member. But the meaning of open is to more open to you for making better research consortium. We have been working together for the rest of seven years. And then uh, I'm very pleased to announce we have about uh, the 120,000 uh, cases and more. And uh, there are many variations for contribution, but, uh, but also we are uh, trusting each other and then supporting each other to make better trauma care system. So, I am very happy to hear today from many of my colleagues from the Asian community. For the first time we met in the, uh, in the, the Petos meeting, uh, at the time the many community has a very few system and then uh, research opportunity there. So now today I got many messages from many uh, neighborhood countries. They are struggling to develop research database and an education module and implementation program. So I'm very envy <laughs> for many, my colleagues are working very well. So I should do hurry up in my country together. So now we are starting to hear about the epidemiology report uh, from Petos uh, CRN. The Hanna Yoon, uh, who is an uh, assistant professor of my department. She's working at the critical care services operated by my university hospital. Now she has a, a program, emergency medicine training, had a, a program in Seoul National University Hospital and fellowship. And now she is uh, working for the critical care services, a Seoul Mobile Intensive Care Unit. So she will uh, present about the epidemiologic report of the, uh, the current PATHOS database. Please, welcome. Hello, my name is Hannah Yoon uh, from Patos CRN. Uh, thank you for participating in Patos 8th research workshop uh, during very busy schedule. Uh, today, my topic is about brief report about Patos epidemiology data, phase one to three. Uh, we are starting to collect Patos phase three data from January 2020. 21, and I analyzed the data from the phase one to July 20, 22. So, so far we have collected phase three data about 67,559 cases. And this is the number of entries, uh, total 195,274 cases were collected so far. Uh, about 50.1% uh, is from Korean data and 15% from Vietnam, Malaysia, Singapore, Taiwan, Japan, India, Thailand, Philippines, China, and UAE. Uh, total 11 countries have entered the PATHOS data. Uh, for the sex and age distribution, uh, from PATHOS 1 to 3, a uh, total 62.4 patient was male patient and 37.5 was female patient. And this is the age, age distribution. Uh, most common age visiting ED for injury was the 20s, uh, followed by the 50s and the 60s. And about 
61.8% uh, of patients uh, visited ED from pre-hospital by using ambulance and about 18% visited ED from pre-hospital by non-EMS. And about 15% of the patient uh, came from the other hospital by using ambulance and non-EMS. Uh, for the injury characteristics, uh, first, this is the intention of the injury. Uh, most of the cases was the unintentional injury, but there was 4.6% uh, of self-harm or suicidal attempt patient, and about 4% was the victim of the assault. And there's pretty many cases of unknown in intention also. And for the cause of the injury, uh, as you know, the, many of the, most of the patient, many of the patient, about 36 point, 36% is from the traffic accident, followed by the fall and the blunt injury and penetrating injuries. As so relevant to the injury cause, the place that occurred most of the injury was the street, highway, and other transportation area, followed by home and residential area and about 10% occurred at the industrial area. And about 31.8% of the patients was doing their daily living when the injury occurred. And uh, about 14 to 15% was traveling during the injury, followed by the work and education. Uh, most common body part of the injury was the head and face, followed by lower extremity and upper extremity and other thorax injury and abdomen injuries. And from here is the patient outcome. Uh, about 47% patient was treated at ED and then discharged, and about 40% was admitted at the hospital and 1.4% of the patient died at ED. And for injury severity score, uh, about 72% experienced only mild injury, IS score 1 to 8, and 17% was moderate, and 8% was severe, and 3% was had very critical injuries or death. And this is the last uh, slide of my presentation. Uh, I could only calculate it, uh, analyze the GOS of uh, at the 470, 400, uh, 147,000 patients. Uh, and about 70% of the patient was discharged with mild or no disability from the hospital and 19% with moderate disability and 5% with severe disability and 1% of vegetative status. This is my presentation. Yeah, Thank very, you for listening. Very simple demographic report of uh, after phase three, we have already released uh, uh, 120,000 cases of phase one phase data to be published by uh, Patos contribution site uh, researchers and scientists. After that, 2021, we have collected data more, and now we have about the, uh, 76, uh, 67 uh, thousand cases are collected during the, uh, the pandemic era. Uh, the research and the updates will be presented by the uh, Dr. Chong. Dr. Chong is uh, uh, one of the very uh, active member of the uh, Korean Petos. And the Jung are uh, trained and educated in Jeonnam National University Hospital, which is uh, located in the southern part of the city, which is a kind of a food city, like a Bangkok. I love every time. So also Dr. Jung is one of the big chefs. So <laughs> he's uh, now clinical professor of Jeonnam National University Hospital. And then Gwangju, which is uh, uh, the capital city of the Jeonnam uh, Gwangju province, and then uh, Donggu Fire Station Medical Director. Could you uh, update for research agenda and uh, result from Petos, please? Uh,
thank you. Uh, hello, uh, this is Dr. Jung from uh, South Korea. Uh, in this section, uh, I'm going to update the res uh, recent research agenda since the last year's PATOS meeting. Uh, as many of you know, uh, there are a uh, total five research communities uh, in PATOS. Uh, up to today, there have been total um, 74 proposals since the beginning of PATHOS. Uh, let's look at the research agenda in detail. Uh, the first committee, uh, Trauma Epidemiology Prevention, uh, has uh, 12 proposals. Uh, second, uh, second uh, in, in EMS Trauma Care, 21 proposals. E ED Trauma Care, 8 proposals. Hospital Trauma Care, uh, 4 proposals. Trauma system monitoring, 11 proposals. Uh, there, are, uh, there have been seven withdrawal uh, by authors and three rejected proposals after discussion in research committee and seven uh, proposals in on the review of CRN. Uh, this is the list of already published research title up to today. Uh, total, uh, uh, 12 research papers have been published in, uh, in the various journal. Uh, and this is the newly updated research proposals. Uh, total four research titles have been proposed and approved by research committee, uh, commit, uh, committee chairs. Uh, chair of four authors and hope to be accepted in a notable journals uh, in a short period. Uh, Pathos network and database could have been developed up to now. Uh, thanks to all of you who are participating with an, an uh, enthusiasm and sincere devotion. Uh, there is no doubt that we can grow more and more by publishing many research, researches using Pathos data. Uh, if, if any one of you uh, has a research idea, uh, please let us know by sending a study proposal request form to pathos.crn.gmail.com. Uh, then our research committee chairs will leave your proposals and give you a reply in a short period. Uh, uh, if you are accepted by research committee, uh, then you can start writing papers using Pathos data. Uh, good luck to uh, all of you who proposed research idea. Uh, thank you for listening, and we hope to get lots and lots of research proposals. Thank you. OK, now we are moving to the uh, uh, special, oh, uh, before going to special uh, uh, lecture, uh, we would like to get some uh, uh, upcoming uh, Pathos events, which is not uh, included in the, the hard, uh, hard print uh, book, but uh, the, uh, Dr. Lee will briefly uh, present about the upcoming Pathos events in the future. Dr. Lee is, uh, okay, uh, she's uh, currently the EMS Fellow of Seoul National University Hospital. And uh, uh, she uh, trained at the Donggung University uh, and uh, is an hospital. And then now she's uh, working for the uh, uh, trauma and then uh, EMS uh, fellowship in, in our department. Uh, please welcome. Oh, thank you for kind introduction, Professor. Hello, this is Gangmin Lee, and I'd like to share the upcoming Pathos event in chronological order. Uh, the uh, EMS Korea 2022 will be held for this week in Busan, South Korea, for two days. And uh, the EPIC TBI course, which was planned on June, postponed because of COVID-19. Uh, the first Pathos Thailand Symposium will be held on November 16th to 18th, 2022 in Thailand. 
Uh, on the first day of the symposium, Pastos uh, Epic TBI co course will be held for pre-hospital provider and ED provider. Next day, the one, uh, first Asian trauma symposium hosted by Syria Hospital and endorsed by the Pathos Journey is pl planned. Uh, last day, the Pathos Research Workshop will be held for trauma research and coordination. Uh, next, Patos CRN uh, hosted oral abstraction, abstract presentation meeting every year. We are plan planning to hold the third meeting under the name of Patos Research Day 2022 in December. Uh, the purpose of this event is to motivate research by the Patos member about trauma using collected data. We would like to ask to write paper and attend in this meeting. Uh, last, uh, the two 12th Asian Conference for Emergency Medicine, Medicine in Manila, Philippines on F April 28th to 30th, 30th to, to, uh, 2023. Uh, this is the uh, last event and despite uh, COVID-19 is continued, it's very glad to meet you here in good health. Uh, Patos CR and truly hope to enjoy the rest of your journey. Thank you. Okay, uh, uh, some uh, more information should be uh, delivered to you. And for the Patos Thailand Symposium is uh, first organized now. We had an online meeting with uh, Pato CRN and uh, Thailand uh, PI Dr. Sata and group. The, we have decided to host the meeting in the for the first time in Thailand, November 16 to 18 in Bangkok, not Chiang Mai. <laughs> so first day is education day. The Epic TBI will be provided for the physician and the plaster care provided nurse and then EMTs. And then we had uh, many times of training sessions before, and then Japan, Korea, and Thailand, uh, the Singapore, and uh, Vietnam, uh, Malaysia. So we'll have a uh, training sessions on Wednesday. And if you want to be an instructor, we are welcoming. So four person, we have uh, four sessions, four persons from uh, international instructor and four person from the Thailand instructor. We'll make a team and then getting together and make uh, some good team training. So we have already the uh, whole uh, training materials are set up. So we'll give a good information, uh, uh, <coughs> opportunity to educate the training. And second day is our main trauma symposium. The, uh, Dr. Satar's hospital hosts a meeting with the uh, Thailand Emergency Medicine Society. And uh, we will have uh, the trauma burden and epidemic on whole Asia. And then how, uh, what is the difference of the trauma system in the Asian community? And then how can we develop the, and benchmark the uh, trauma system and research? Which is the, uh, hosted by the Shiraira Hospital and endorsed by uh, Pato CRN. So if you want to attend the meeting as a, some speaker and moderator, we will uh, collect a team, but we have some limited fund. So please come to the Bangkok by yourself, okay? And third day is a research workshop. Research workshop means a, a very different from this meeting. It is a kind of a technical training for the Pato's dictionary and the uh, PETOS uh, the data collection system, and the more information about the uh, AIS, ISS, GOS. So we are targeting more the uh, reading junior faculty of the Thailand, each hospitals, and uh, research assistant to provide more uh, information about how can we collect data, which is the exact data, how can it data uh, uh, quality uh, management we do. So those kind of training uh, workshop will be followed by uh, a th a third day. So there need about the three to four instructors from the community. Dr. Chua, are you going to UK? Yeah, it's very close coming and working and donate your excellent talent 
and uh, maybe doctor, uh, many doctors are coming together. So, so this is a very uh, good event for collaborating for Thailand Vectors team and empowering and uh, 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 a kind of uh, the collecting the many research scientists from the country. So the other is uh, from, yep. Yeah, the first is uh, Wednesday, November 16, and then Trauma Symposium on November 17 is uh, uh, Thursday, and then Research Workshop is uh, Friday, so followed by the Friday, yeah. Okay, so uh, this event will be supported by Leodar uh, from Korean Leodar and then each country Leodar's sponsor for some uh, international speakers and instructors travel cost. And the others will be invited by the uh, part CRN and then they can travel by themselves. Yeah, okay. Any questions about that? From online, any question or comment for November Thailand Symposium? Wen Chu Chang, are you there? Okay, he's busy. Dr. Sun? Yes. Uh, yeah, are you? I thought Dr. Chu Chang will be, uh, will be the Thailand. Okay, yeah. he'll be the Thailand. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> you guarantee. So, Thailand government, uh, the, the Taiwan government allowed your travel to the Thailand? Uh, in Taiwan now, uh, uh, it's allowed to uh, to on board, but uh, back when back to the Taiwan, we have to uh, we have the quarantine of up for the three days. Okay. Now still, yeah. Okay. I think the, the Ta uh, Taiwan and China has uh, some big has a big tension. So I think you all working for the military service. No, okay. So the one of the Senate leader from United States coming and back, and then the tension is increased, so they cannot come to my country. I think not quarantine issue. Okay, just to, just kidding. So, uh, so uh, from the, uh, the maybe the currently the COVID is a little bit make some big wave in many countries. So at the time uh, we are hopefully, uh, we expect the uh, number of cases will be decreased before winter. Any any comment from the online? Okay, and uh, uh, ACEM, uh, it was not, I, I, heard, I did not hear about the exact information about the trauma session or workshop. Any, any comment from uh, uh, Philippines for Next year, please. Okay, we will give uh, more updates after the communicating with the ACM uh, event. And then AAEMS already have set up the meeting in 2000, 2021, 2022. So the COVID private uh, our meeting uh, from her, uh, hosting in Tokyo. So 2023, maybe June, the AAEMS will be held in Tokyo and then we will absolutely be there to host the, the Petos meeting with the Asian colleagues. Thank you, Dr. Shin, for your moderating the last session. So we have all done uh, the entire Petos uh, research meeting in two days. So we have to close uh, the uh, part of research workshop. Before before we closing, uh, Dr. Shin, could you give us a brief uh, closing message to all the participants? I have given us a speech in the further opening uh, remark. Uh, it is uh, uh, the very event uh, after two years of uh, waiting for open meeting in Petos group. So we had a success meeting uh, yesterday and today. So we have a uh, uh, great uh, the idea sharing and uh, information. So I want to 
all of you to go back safely. And uh, before going back effort, enjoy. And then do not infect, uh, get the infection, COVID. Okay, so uh, enjoy the city, enjoy the time, and then see you in uh, October in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia or November in Thailand, Bangkok. And then next year, uh, Philippines, Manila. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. Okay, thank you, everyone. Have a nice day. And we will see you soon in October, November, December. Thank you.